balance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now turn our board meeting over to our board attorney, Jill Wilson, who will lead us in the process of electing a chair and vice chair. Welcome, Jill. Board members, it's that time of year again. It's the annual time to elect leadership for the Board of Education. This time, just to avoid me having to walk them back and forth in front of the camera a million times, I have had placed at your places small ballots in case we need them. And you'll see there's chair and vice chair so we don't get anything mixed up. So why don't you orient yourself to what's there. Maybe we won't need them, but just in case we do, we would of course start with chair. So I will open the floor for nominations for the position of chair. I'd like to make a motion to nominate Dana Page as our chair. Can you turn your thing up? And uh, by the way, no, uh, nominations do not require a second. I nominate Linda Wellborn. Are there other nominations? All right, the nominations are closed. If you will please write your uh, choice on the ballot that says chair and then sign your name and those ballots will be available for anyone who would like to examine them. There's no such thing as confidential voting in public meetings. I will collect them. And board members, by a vote of six to three, you have elected Dina Hayes as your chair again. Congratulations, Chairman Hayes. And I will allow you or cede the floor to you for the election of vice chair. And the same process will apply. You have written ballots uh, that say vice chair on them for your use. Great. Thank you, Jill. And thank you to uh, my colleagues for your support and my leadership. Um, is there a motion for vice chair? I nominate Linda Wellborn. I like to nominate Winston McGregor. No other nominations? All right, please um, put your preference on your board vice chair sheet. And congratulations to Ms. McGregor by a vote of five to four. And I will have those ballots available for anyone who would like to see them. Excellent. Well, thank you. And congratulations, Winston. It's been a pleasure serving with you. And I look forward to um, our, our collaboration and partnership again. Thank you uh, for all of our board members for your uh, participation as well. Um, we will begin our meeting tonight with uh, recognitions. At this time, I'd like to ask board member at large, Winston McGregor, to proceed with our first recognition, which is a little awkward. Well, it's not awkward for me, and I hope it's not awkward for you that 
It's my honor tonight to recognize Dina Hayes as a finalist for the Council of the Great City Schools Green Garner Award. Um, I'm not going to make you go to the podium. Thank you. I'll do it from here. Thank you. Um, Dina was one of nine finalists competing for the award, which honors outstanding contributions to urban education. She's a tireless advocate for improving racial equity and eradicating gaps in access and achievement for students of color, students living in poverty, English language learners, and children who are differently abled. Dina represents District 8, and she's been a member of the board since 2002. She's the former Human Relations Commissioner for Greensboro, co-chair of the North Carolina Public School Forum, chairwoman of the International Civil Rights Center and Museum's Board of Directors, and a member of the um, Community City Working Group. She's the managing director of the Racial Equity Institute, a privately held company, and has more than 16 years of experience as a community and institutional organizer. In 2019, Dina received the Benjamin Elijah Mays Lifetime Achievement Award from the National School Board Association's Council of Urban Boards of Education. This is the highest honor from a school board member can receive. We are so proud of Dina and the work she's done to support the children of Guilford County Schools. And it's my honor to present her with the award, recognizing her as a national finalist for the Green Garner Award for Outstanding Contributions to Urban Education. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't know I was competing for the award, <laughs> but I am honored to be among some incredible leaders across this country that have been relentless uh, in advocating for uh, children um, that come to school with enormous barriers. So thank you to my colleagues um, again. So now I would like to uh, take, my, take great pleasure uh, in uh, honoring a group of employees whose work is critical to the operation of our district. We are grateful to them for their tireless work on behalf of the district. Um, will our Chief Financial Officer, and Angie Henry, please come to the podium. Make you stand there for a minute. <laughs> Uh, for the 27th straight year, the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada awarded Guilford County Schools its Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Just want to pause there for a minute to say for the 27th straight year, the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada awarded Guilford County Schools its Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting. That certificate recognizes state and local governments for successfully demonstrate, that successfully demonstrate transparency and full disclosure in preparing comprehensive annual financial reports. The award was given for the district's comprehensive annual financial report for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. We are so proud of our financial services staff for their attention to detail and their efforts to share that detail with the public. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to ask board member Pat Tillman to step down and present Angie with a certificate of recognition for this achievement. Thank you, Madam Chair. It gives me great pleasure, uh, Angie, uh, to present this uh, certificate of recognition from Guilford County Schools on behalf of our Board of Education, this community, and the superintendent. It's presented to your financial services group for receiving an award of excellence in financial reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association. And may I also underscore that this achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of government accounting and financial reporting. Angie, um, you, you do our district proud. All of your colleagues do us very proud. And, it's my real pleasure, pleasure and privilege to present this to you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. I just want to, want to take a second to um, uh, acknowledge 
the Board of Education and all the support that you um, provide our financial services team, certainly to the superintendent who works um, tirelessly to be sure we're doing everything right um, in every transaction. Um, to Tara Trexler, who's not here today, our senior executive director in finance, who's working hard not just on our uh, financial services, but on our uh, new system implementation. And then uh, here with me, we have representatives from our accounting department, our accounts payable department, our budget department, payroll, purchasing, school accounting, and school nutrition all fall under the umbrella of uh, financial services. And again, and um, while they, they, this team works very, very hard every day to be sure that um, we can continue to earn these awards, and it also takes help from across the district, um, everybody that has a, a role in, in the budget process or in um, the financial process certainly works hard as well. So I want to um, recognize them and our team who's here. They're just going to wave rather than come up and shake hands. So, Angie, can uh, you say their names? Can certainly. you say their names? I certainly and, and will they be glad wave to. so that we can recognize um, them. So Andrea Lawrence is in our accounting department. Kathy Ocheo is our, our new um, administrative assistant in finance. Shelly Hodges is in our accounts payable department. Joyce Good is in our school accounting. Angie Luderman is in, uh, she's our assistant finance officer. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Aisha, <laughs> Aisha's new to our budget department. She's handling our uh, IDEA funds. Uh, Kim Cramsey is in our payroll department, leading our payroll department right now. Pat Baker is our budget manager. And uh, Janet, um, she's not Harrison anymore, but she is in our accounting department. <laughs> uh, Bob Rivers is here. He's in our uh, fixed assets. He works at our fixed assets. And I think that covers everybody that's here from finance tonight. Excellent. That's certainly not the whole team, but a great representation. <laughs> Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much. And congratulations. And finally, tonight uh, we have a very, very special recognition and one that I'm honored to share. Um, would Mr. Dudley Floyd, Dr. Dudley Floyd, please come to the podium at this time. Flood. I know a Dudley Floyd. The Board of Education uh, would like to recognize Dr. Dudley Flood for his groundbreaking work as a champion of equity. Dr. Flood, a lifelong educator, is noted for his work at the state level. In the years following Brown versus Board of Education, when the mandate of desegregation was slowly becoming a reality, he, along with his colleague, Jean Cosby, visited all 100 counties in North Carolina, working with schools and communities to bridge the racial divide and build connections to help us move forward toward racial equity in education. Dr. Flood inspired the creation of the Public School Forum of North Carolina's Flood Center for Educational Equity and Opportunity, which aims to achieve racial equity in education across North Carolina in the fields of research, policy, and practice. He was recently recognized with the state's highest honor, the North Carolina Award for Public Service. Dr. Flood's life-changing work is an example to educators and equity warriors everywhere, and the Board of Education honors him with a proclamation of appreciation for your significant contributions. I'd like to ask board member Diane Bellamy Smalls to read aloud the proclamation. Honoring the work of Dr. Dudley Flood. Whereas Dr. Dudley Flood dedicated his career to education in North Carolina as a teacher, principal, and state administrator. Whereas Dr. Flood's extraordinary efforts were instrumental in desegregating schools in North Carolina. Whereas he, along with his colleague, Jean Causey, per personally advocated in all 100 counties in North Carolina in an effort to unite divided communities after the Supreme Court ruled on Brown versus the Board of Education. Whereas he spent 21 years at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction working towards equitable education experiences for North Carolina students, whereas he has proven himself to be a lifelong champion for equity in education. Whereas Dr. Flood's work, words, example, inspired the creation of the Public School Forum of North Carolina's Flood Center for Education, Equity, and Opportunity, 
which aims to achieve racial equity in education across North Carolina through building connections and engagement across fields for, of research, policy, and practice. Whereas he spread his message of educational equity throughout North Carolina, the United States, and the world through countless speeches and articles, as well as authoring three books. You getting tired? <laughs> Whereas in retirement, he continued his service through the state by working with multiple organizations, including the North Carolina Minority Cancer Awareness Action Team, the Public School Forum of North Carolina Board, the Wake Education Partnership Leadership Council, and the University of North Carolina Press Advancement Council. Whereas Dr. Flood has received more than 350 awards for civic services, including most recently the North Carolina Award for Public Service, the state's highest honor. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Guilford County School Board of Education, recognizes and, for, are, and are forever grateful for the significant contributions of Dr. Dudley Flood to our state and our nation. This is signed on, De on December the 14th by uh, Dina Hayes, Chair, and Dr. Sharon uh, Contreras, uh, Superintendent of Gilbert County Schools. Thank you, Diane. At this time, I'd like to ask Board Member Betty Jenkins to step down and present Dr. Flood with a special award of recognition for this achievement. Madam Chair, <clears throat> Madam Superintendent, members of this August board, and all who assemble, <clears throat> you honor me more than you can imagine for reasons that you probably hadn't thought of. More than 50 years ago, it was my enjoyable pleasure to work with the school district as it put together its plan for desegregation. I look, look at the board and you're so young, you would not remember Wink House, uh, who was then superintendent of this school system, and Mr. Pierce, who was superintendent of the county. There's one person nodding. <laughs> uh, thank you. And, and, uh, uh, and Mel Swan, who was a very personal, uh, longtime friend, and others. Um, if I may take the personal privilege to introduce my accompanying family, uh, my niece, Ruga Thomas, who is a product of this school system, <clears throat> and uh, who also taught in this school system until her retirement. And then my nephew, Gilbert Reynolds, <clears throat> uh, who was a victim of my teaching. <clears throat> every minute of every day he thinks and uh, I, I want to thank the school system for having had another of my nephew and nieces and particularly one grand nephew uh, that uh, in spite of himself you educated I mean really in spite of himself he had no predilection <laughs> for being educated 
and today he is a successful uh, deep sea underwater welder. Uh, we pray that he would live to see that day. <laughs> and thanks to you, uh, he did so. <clears throat> I would reminisce on just one occasion, if you would allow me, that in the early uh, days of our work around 1971, uh, this school system had a retreat uh, in which it invited each of the school principals, each of the presidents of the PTA, and each of the uh, uh, groups of somebody from the teaching staff. And he went to Betsy Jeff Penn 4-H camp uh, up in the woods. I, I wouldn't know how to get back there now. Don't even know if it still exists. And the regulation was that nobody brought their car. We brought a bus. So there wasn't any probability of anyone leaving until we have consummated the business for which we were there. <laughs> we did not have a homogeneous group. We did not want a homogeneous group. We wanted a diverse group. And trust me when I tell you, it was diverse. But we left there with a plan that has been an historic one. And I've referenced it all over this country. Everywhere I've been, I refer to that specific plan that you consummated 53 years ago. So you've been a model. And I'm as grateful to you for that. Well, almost as grateful as I am for this. <laughs> I, I don't want to get these things out of order. I'm more grateful for this. But I, I am so appreciative and, and honored that you would choose to to share this time with me. And thank you so much. And my family thanks you for this, for this occasion. Thank you. And Since we have the um, honor and pleasure of having Dr. Flood here with us, we would like to recess for about 15 minutes so that our staff and uh, the board can, um, you know, um, have pictures, have conversations, um, and just uh, be able to um, have an opportunity to uh, hear more about not only a challenging time, but a very dangerous time that we owe um, so much gratitude for. So, um, so we'll recess for about 15 minutes. And then we'll come back and get on with our business.
All right, we'd like to uh, reassemble so we can get back to our agenda. We are now at um, public comments and we have about 27 uh, speakers. Um, our first speaker is Melanie Gata, followed by Steve Pruitt. And as you're approaching the podium, we'd just like to remind you, you have three minutes. Uh, if you will begin by saying your name and address, when the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. And when the red light comes on, um, your time is up. And we ask you to refrain from mentioning students or staff names. Thank you. You may begin. Welcome. Hold on just a minute. I'm not sure if the mic is, is, is on or activated. Here we go. Thank you. Melanie Gatta, Har River Road, Oak Ridge. I'm a proud mother of my four children that attend Guilford County Schools. I have a sixth grader at Northwest Middle, and my three youngest are at Oak Ridge Elementary. Both are great schools. I'm here to be the voice of many, many families that are requesting the mass mandate to finally be optional. The county commissioners have lifted the indoor mandate and our poor children are one of the last with the teachers and the staff. Children are getting sick wearing these for many hours. Dry mouth, rashes, bloody noses. My own sixth grader was sent home lightheaded and nauseous after being required to wear this during an indoor gym. There are vaccines available for all school age children and adults if they choose to, and with an optional vote, it will be okay to still wear one if you choose. Um, we've had enough of these masks, as you as well. We should be able to decide for ourselves and for our children to keep wearing them or not. Our schools need to be back to normal. With that being said, it saddens me that each monthly meeting, you're not discussing the restrictions that is in place for not allowing parent volunteers again. Prior to COVID, I had a full involvement at the school. Myself and so many other parents volunteered our free time, helping students, teachers, administrations, libraries, cafeterias, field trips. It blows me away that we're still not allowed to be involved given our free time. Outside personnel can go in for testing and other situations, but these are our children from our homes and I can't go in to help them. Talking with teachers, administrations, they all want additional help and involvement. At each board meeting, we hear how stressed the teachers are with everything they need to handle along with the lack of substitutes, planning periods being cut and the discipline issues. Our elementary can't even have lunch in the cafeteria still because of mandates and the low staffing without the parents' help. Within the county, there are hundreds of parents that are willing and able and offer free time and support, but we're not allowed. It makes us feel there's something to hide, but surely there can't be, right? You all speak of wanting great school systems and having our children in the best interest, but it's not showing in any of the decisions that you're making. Please make a note right now to discuss this and make these changes. You will make many children, parents, and teachers happy again. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Steve Pruitt, followed by Shana Richards. Welcome, Mr. Pruitt. As you're approaching the podium, just want to remind you, you have three minutes to make your comments. We'd like you to begin with your name and your address. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Yes, my name is uh, Steve Pruitt. I live at 1206 Valley View Street, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And I am currently employed with Guilford County Schools. I've been with y'all for nine years now. I work in the maintenance department. Um, I enjoy working there, but we, we're losing... I mean, we're down five men in grounds right now. Seven, the maintenance is down a third of staff because of the pay. We lost good people because of the pay this year. That's been a lot of talk about it. Another thing is about, I want to know about our bonuses. Uh, there's been lots about the bonus. Now, are we going to get one this year at Christmas time? Um, I, I'm hearing that the first year the states will be giving us uh, 2.5 and then uh, uh, $1,500 in the month. But we might way less than what we think y'all do. If I tell you how much I make, it's, it's a joke what we make. 
But my question is, is about our pay. Um, there's a lot of talk about our pay, about our, uh, just about uh, our pay and about um, the bonus. The, the, you know, and I know once every three months now we're getting we're getting attention bonus. And I appreciate that. That's really, I, I could use that. And I appreciate that. But the thing is about uh, our pay situation. Um, I was wondering about that. Are, are, we, are we going to get increased in January two point five percent? Is it going to, you know, and the cost of living goes up every year. The cost of everything goes up, you know. And, and I hear a lot of stuff about you know, people, teachers, and everything getting raises. But like the maintenance staff is always put aside. We've always been put aside about things we do, you know. And, and this, we we work hard for y'all year round. We do all kind of things. Every department is getting is, is short of staff because of, of the pay, and, and, and the bonus. Well, my question is, is I like to know about our bonus, t a bonus, or we get one, you know, this year at Christmas time. That's been a lot of talk about it. And I watched the board meeting back last month, and it was talked about giving 5,600 of the 9,000 employees. Y'all talked about that, and there's been a lot of talk about that too. And I like to know about that situation. Is that going to change? Are we getting one this year or we're not? We, we would like to know. That's just me and other people talking too. Um, but... That's my main objective is I hope y'all look at our pay scale and raise our pay up this coming year. More than 2.5 be nice because I mean, but I can tell you what I make, it, it's, it'll blow you away. But I've been there, I, I work in grounds, I've been there nine years. I've got a great supervisor. I like him, he's really good. And we got good people who works there. Got a group, good guys work with us, real good guys. But I really wish y'all consider about the bonus situation for us this year. It would look good if we get one, you know, just talk about that. And another thing is about our pay this coming year, that our pay will go up. That really help. You know, a lot of guys are working two jobs just to pay the bills. A lot of guys I work with, myself included, we're working two jobs. We shouldn't have to do that. That's the problem we, we face all the time. But it's got to be something done about our pay. Raise it up, you know, to uh, living expenses and, um, and our bonus. I appreciate your time, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pruitt. Thank you for everything that you do for our schools. I appreciate it. Thank you. Shana Richards, followed by Lisa McCoy-Reed. Welcome, Ms. Richards. As you're walking to the podium, I'd just like to begin with saying your name and address, and you have three minutes to make your comments when the amber light comes on. Uh, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Awesome. Shauna Richards, Shauna. Mill Creek Court, Greensboro. I'm a professional school counselor at Guilford E-Learning University Prep, where I work with the most amazing students, staff, and families. I am also the Vice President of GCAE and the GCS Counselor of the Year. I absolutely love working as a professional school counselor because every day I get to work with and see the future of Guilford County. As my students grow, share their ideas, and remind me of my why each and every day. I have been with Guilford County Schools long enough to hear our superintendent talk about the innovative schools of the future. The vision that she has shared is one that would make most adults want to return to K-12 education. She talks about schools with a state-of-the-art technology, school buildings that are places where our children, families, and communities are proud to call their own and are hubs of learning, culture, diversity, and equity. Close your eyes for just a moment. Think about the amazing and innovative school in your community. While your eyes are closed, what does that school look like? What sounds come to mind? What smells are coming from the cafeteria? What people are in that building? We challenge our students to dream big. And as you are in fact dreaming about the innovative and creative school in your community, if the bus drivers are no longer available to safely deliver our children to school, if the teacher assistants aren't there to provide that added layer of support, if our counselors aren't there to assist and support our students, if our teachers are not in the building to teach, guide, challenge, and nurture our children, then the innovative schools of the future will simply be pretty buildings with modern technology, without staff to drive, feed, counsel, teach, nourish, and grow the minds of our most precious children. The pandemic has been an added stressor, stressor to our students, staff, and school communities. I have watched as my friends and colleagues have left the district and the profession. It's heartbreaking because the impact of those vacancies are felt 
by those of us who have remained with the district. But more than anyone, those vacancies are felt most by our students. Guilford teachers and staff are at a tipping point. Our employees are asking for a bonus of $4,000 so that our students don't have to deal with the loss, grief, and frustration that comes with staff turnover. Our students deserve the best. And in this moment, the GCS Board of Education can ensure that our students receive the best that GCS has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations. Uh, Lisa McCoy-Reed, followed by Kenya Donaldson. As you're approaching the podium, please begin by introducing yourself and your address. Uh, you have three minutes to make your comments, and when the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Lisa McCoy-Reed, 9, Lake Bluff Court, Greensboro, North Carolina. Eight years ago, I, along with others, presented to this board over 2,200 signatures advocating for curriculum change and for educational standards in Guilford County. We reminded the board that the Supreme Court had ruled that the responsibility of what is taught rests with the elected school board. You work for the parents. We presented numerous examples of current teaching assignments that were of a concern to many parents. In addition, Kathy Barnett and I traveled to Raleigh where we met with attorney Tammy Fitzgerald. There, we talked with members of the state house and senate of both parties, advocated for, and saw legislation drafted that would have aligned the character education values from our school handbook to our classroom curriculum. Amos Quick, Paul Daniels, were the lone voices on the school board that understood the seriousness of the issues presented and advocated vocally for curriculum change. Tonight, I speak to not only to you, but also to those listening and watching. Recently, we have seen Virginia parents expose the promotion of racial hatred, pornography, and even pedophilia in their schools. For similar reasons, Wake County parents have recently filed suit against their board. As parents and citizens of Guilford County, we have a responsibility to take an active role in the educational process of our children. Schools exist to teach children how to think critically, not what to think. As it is said, we reap what we sow, later than we sow, and more than we sow. Nationally and locally, many teach and thus promote an atheistic, violent, racist, arrogant, angry curriculum. We see the results of that instruction being played out in headlines all across our nation. Many of today's classes promote atheism, revisionist history, communistic ideology, and sexuality without morals or ethics. As a result, we see a confused and broken generation, more medicated than any generation in history, more addicted than ever before. Many with very little work ethic and very few meaningful friendships. Now to sit on the sidelines and to do nothing is to not care. I encourage all parents to know what their children are being taught and to become part of developing standards in our educational process, I invite every board member to make this issue top priority. Our children are worth it. Who will help? Thank you. Thank you. Kenya Donaldson, followed by Amy Harrison. Welcome, Kenya. You know, as you're approaching the stadium, please begin with your podium. Please. Um, so your name and address, and you have three minutes to speak. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Kenya Donaldson, 2406 Wheatfield Drive, Greensboro. Dr. Contreras, thank you for the time you spent with the GCAE leadership team this week, last week. During our time together, we discussed why our colleagues needed and wanted, deserved bonuses. We shared our concern for the children and the impact that resignations and retirements have had on the quality of their learning. We appreciate you listening to our truth. Thank you. 
Today, I present a petition on behalf of the Guilford County employees. We have over 2,500 signatures of employees and representation from every work site in our district. We understand that the funding crisis stems from what has happened at the state level. The funding crisis is historic across our state. But this petition appeals to the board to provide bonuses for our staff members now. We, the employees of Guilford County Schools, are essential to the education of our next generation. We love our jobs, but for too long, we have been treated as though our labor is a given. Underfunding of our schools is a reckless and negligent act that impacts our livelihoods and the students' education as highly qualified employees continue to leave in droves. Every coworker we lose to higher paying jobs, less stressful jobs, is a blow to our children's education. We, the employees of Guilford County School, are on the front lines of a crisis this year. In the, uh, this year, with GCAE, we have consistently advocated for full funding for schools far beyond staff pay. But we know that a consistent skilled school staff is an irreplaceable component of our student success and that staff loss is the most urgent threat to students' education in GCS right now. With ESSER funds, our board has the rare opportunity to shield employees from over a decade of cuts to pay and school resources. We, the employees of Guilford County Schools, are calling on the Board of Education to do what the North Carolina General Assembly refuses to do, value our labor. We, the 10,000 who enable, protect, educate, and uplift 73,000 students. We, the 10,000 human beings who make school, school happen every day. Not the buildings, not the computers, not the tests, are Guilford County Schools. Guilford County employees call on the Guilford County School Board to address the staffing crisis before it's too late. Use less than 10% of the allotted $307 million in ESSER funds to provide bonuses for each Guilford County employee. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing your voices tonight. Thank you, Kenya. Um, Amy Harrison, followed by Nolan Jones. So you're approaching the podium. Um, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments, and when you see the amber light, come on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. My name is Amy Harrison. Am I at... Oh, sorry. My name is Amy Harrison, and my address is 7385 Wood Springs Drive in Whitsett. I teach and live in Mrs. Welburn's District, District 4. I'm in my 22nd year of teaching in North Carolina and my 15th in Guilford County. I'm here tonight to advocate for a $4,000 bonus for all employees of Guilford County Schools using ESSER funds. I've heard a lot of comments about not taking any funds away from our students and making sure that their needs are being met. I understand this completely, and I want the same thing. But giving all employees this bonus would directly affect our students. Having experienced staff in our district help our students progress academically and have safe learning environments. One of our teacher assistants at my school has been working with us for four years. He has developed relationships with some of our students with behavioral challenges and has learned what causes their behaviors. He's able to talk with them and remind them of strategies to de-escalate and return to class quickly. He's helped these students avoid meltdowns and remain in the classroom learning. His experience with these students is invaluable and has been learned over his time working with these students. A new assistant wouldn't know what is needed or what causes their behavior. Having experienced staff is vital. After all, student learning conditions are educator and staff working conditions. Another invaluable colleague of mine is our youth development coordinator. He focuses on developing relationships with our young men in particular who need a positive male role model. Like our teacher assistant, he has learned so much about our students and can help them regulate their behaviors quickly so they can remain in class. These students look up to him and respond well to his advice. He could work another job what pays more, but his passion is helping these students. Without these two staff members, my school would not be the same. Having experienced staff is invaluable. 
A bonus can and will provide incentives for these two colleagues to remain with our district because their skills and talents are irreplaceable. I know that much of the responsibility of our pay and other, other benefits is at the state level. I've worked with many of you in the past lobbying our legislators for the schools we all deserve and am committed to continue this collaboration. We have a unique opportunity to help rectify the defunding of our public schools. I ask that you vote tonight for the bonuses for all staff. And as always, thank you for your time tonight and for your service to Guilford County Schools and its students, staff, and citizens. Great. Thank you for your service to our students and to the district. Uh, Nolan Jones, followed by Kalisha McNair. As you're approaching the podium, um, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments, and when the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds. Welcome. Hi, I'm Nolan Jones. You guys remember me from last month and the mm -hmm. month before that and probably through email. <clears throat> but in any case, I'm back, and I wanted to find out if you guys had a chance to go out to your schools, your elementary schools, and watch one of the youngsters, the first grader or younger, type on the QWERTY keyboard through the board. Could you answer for them? Did they? No, this isn't interactive. Okay, it's not. <laughs> but just wink at me if you did. So, <laughs> But the thing is, is that I'm here primarily to ask you guys to take a look into what I, you know, what I had recommended so that you could see firsthand how these kids are struggling. I've heard this from numerous teachers across the country. And they talk about elementary kids needing to type. They just can't do it on the QWERTY keyboard. And what I'm here to tell you also, <clears throat> some really good news. I've got um, sponsorship from the second largest school system here in the state of North Carolina. I've got sponsorship from the board. I've got also sponsorship from the board and the fourth largest in the nation, looking to go to the second largest in the nation. They've been able to recognize the benefit of my keyboard, KeySAC. So I'm just waiting on my hometown of Gifford County to come around and see this benefit also. Because my plan is, is to get this across the nation. I've been in contact with Chicago. And I'm waiting to hear back from them. So I'm warning you guys to come on board. Because I don't want to someday say, well, I went to my hometown and they just flat out just ignored me. But you guys are smarter than that, I know. And plus, I like you. All right? Thank you, guys. Thank you. And have Mr. a good holiday. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You have yes. a good holiday as well. Right. Kalisha McNair, followed by Deb Green. No Kalisha. no Kalisha. So this is Deb Green? Okay. Welcome, Ms. Green. As you approach the podium, please begin with your name and address. And you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Okay. My name is Deb Green. I live at 1620 Forest Valley Road in Greensboro. At the last board meeting, members suggested that educators need to understand that raises last for our careers while a bonus is a one-time situation. So we should appreciate the raise that we got last year. I'm not sure if you understand that many veteran educators who have been with GCS for a long time haven't seen much of a raise for the past few years. My supplement was already close to $610, so my raise last year was $3 a month. GCIE is requesting $4,000 bonuses for all staff. To see that from my last raise, I'd have to work until I'm 161 years old. I have a PhD in education studies, education studies, and I've been teaching for 19 years. $36 for the year does not make me feel appreciated as a professional. In the past year, I helped a student navigate the college application and student loan process. She may be the first one in her family to go to college. I helped her open doors that may change the trajectory of her life. I built a relationship with a sixth grader who wasn't reading when he was supposed to. I read to him and we bonded over the gory details in a book. If he hasn't before, he has now had the experience of associating reading with connecting to others. These experiences are life-changing $36 for the year isn't even close to what I deserve. 
Ms. Bellamy Small suggested that if we don't feel like we get paid enough, educators should reinvent ourselves and create TikTok videos making cookies. Are you suggesting that I stop teaching, ignore the expertise and passion that I have for education, and learn to bake cookies? Or am I supposed to already know that because I'm a woman? I chose my career in hopes of making the world a better place, and I feel so disheartened to know that you think I should just reinvent myself 10 years before I can retire after dedicating my life to education. The last thing GCS ne needs now is for experienced educators to leave the system. We're already losing significantly more educators than in a usual year, and I've heard new teachers say that they're planning on leaving education after this year because they see how veteran teachers are treated and compensated. For each teacher who chooses to reinvent herself, about 150 children lose out. With all due respect, I want to share my raise with you so you can see and understand how it feels. $36. Here's my raise from the past year, and it's going to be my gift to you, the school board. Split it amongst yourselves. Since I get 12-month pay, you will still see more than I see each month. As school board members, as school board members, we expect you to be working for the best education for our children. And that means real respect and real compensation for all educators. Don't divide us by giving some of us raises, but not all. Bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and custodians are invaluable to our children's well-being, as well as counselors, nurses, and the front office staff. We are all doing our best to create a brighter future. We all deserve better. Our children deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. Tessa Penley, followed by Peter uh, Sakaris. And I'm so sorry if I have butchered your name. Welcome. As you approach the podium, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments. And when the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Tessa Penley, and I live on Spry Street in Ms. Jenkins District, and I teach at Union Hill Elementary in Ms. Bellamy Smalls District. I'd like to begin tonight by uplifting one of my favorite little earworms from 2020. It goes something, something like this. The pandemic isn't over just because you're over it. <laughs> Now, I won't go on singing the rest of it for you any more than I already have, and you're welcome for that. Uh, but that's basically the song. The pandemic isn't over just because we are over it. Unfortunately, as true today as it was a year ago, this reality is one that we must ground ourselves in if we are to continue to navigate this and keep our heads above water. And it is why we must both continue to keep mask mandates in our schools and take steps to mitigate the staffing crisis that is currently hurtling our school system toward a point of no return. Regarding this staffing crisis, there is a persistent framing that keeps rearing its head that somehow taking steps to take care of staff will effectively necessitate taking away from the students that we all love. I am here today to say I both resent and reject this framing and would instead like to offer another. What if, instead of acting like the people that make school happen are somehow separate from the schools themselves, we acknowledged that we are our schools. We who cook and clean and program and fix and transport and plan and listen and teach are our schools. When steps are taken to support us, it's schools that benefit. And when we, qualified and experienced staff, leave our school system, it is our students that pay the price. Speaking of price. As my colleagues before me have laid out, over the course of the last week, approximately one quarter of all GCS employees have signed a petition regarding the use of ESSER funds to provide $4,000 bonuses to every single GCS employee. As was made clear during the last month's meeting, there are some of you on the dais who seem to believe that any amount would be unnecessary. So I have little doubt that you may find this $4,000 demand to be outrageous or even egregious. How dare we? But when this number is contextualized against a backdrop of decades of stagnant and suppressed wages, an ongoing pandemic which we are still on the front lines of, and the $307 million in ESSER COVID relief funding, it becomes clear just how reasonable $4,000 is. No, $4,000 is not as good, a $4,000 bonus is not as good as a $4,000 raise. And no, a $4,000 bonus won't end the pandemic. 
Of course, it cannot fix everything that needs fixing. But with this $4,000 will do is make a significant difference in the lives of our people. What this $4,000 will do is offer some tangible acknowledgement of the impact of these last two years. What this $4,000 will do is demonstrate an understanding of the reality of what it has meant and still means to work in our schools. Stand on the side of students by standing on the side of staff and support $4,000 bonuses for all GCS employees. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Sakaris, followed by Sherry Pickett. Apologize if I got your name wrong. Um, you have, um, if you'll begin by saying your name and address, you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. My name is Robert Hussar. I live at 7402 Friendship Glen, Brown Summit 74214. Thank you. When this pandemic started in 2020, we all wore the masks and followed the rules because everyone believed that it was necessary and responsible thing to do. Then after the first lockdown ended, we were told numbers were still rising. Later, numbers started to go down. Everything was reopening, but masks were still in place. Numbers were going back up. The media was covering stories about everyone at gathering had contracted COVID, even if only one person had it. People at hospitals were supposedly staying at stairways. That's when the New York governor requested help from the government, which was granted, and Navy hospital ships were deployed to help. Now everyone is living in panic and fear. Well, what happened? The Navy hospital ships remained empty. Doctors were coming forward that there, were, there are no patients in the hallways. And then we started to learn that most people didn't get COVID, even if their significant other had it. Later, we learned that the numbers of COVID deaths and cases were way off. Today, many people are tired of being lied to and tired of being told what to do by a mass majority of people who live in fear. People like the government telling us to wear masks and to get vaccinated. Paranoid mask wearing people who will wear it when they are alone in their cars. Jogging outdoors by themselves wearing masks. Social media has done number on everyone. Just as Adolf Hitler said, if you will be told a lie and over and over, you will end up believing it. It's brainwashing with propaganda in the 21st century. Our politicians have turned us to ships broke our spirit and now you will do just anything that you are being told. This virus is more political than it is health problem. Why all of the sudden is testing not enough and now the vaccines are being shoved down our throats? Why are, the, why are we being made to quarantine even if we have already tested negative? Why are people who have been vaccinated still being made to wear masks if this vaccine is such a miracle? What? is up with Biden requiring legal immigrants to vaccinate, but illegals crossing border don't vaccinate and can't even be asked about it. Does that sound normal to you? It's all about what fits their political agenda and they use easily brainwashed people to achieve that. This virus, as we have learned, goes up and down, just like something that we all are familiar with, the flu. COVID mainly affects the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions while the flu affects anybody. But what happens to flu? In 2019, we were told that everyone who didn't get vaccinated is going to die in 2020 from flu. And now we don't even hear anything about the flu. Why aren't they re reporting on the infection rates and deaths of the flu anymore? Now let's... You can finish your sentence. Well, I have much more to say. Can you just finish your sentence? About our kids in school. <laughs> you can send that to us, email that to us as well. I just say two sentences. I escaped from communism, uh, came to the United States. I served at the military at the chemical weapons, sarin, nerve agent, and all those chemical weapons. Your mask, your mask, nothing. You know what? You had children. Did you took a napkin and put it, put it and replace it with the diaper? You can't. It's going to leak. Your mask are useless. Thank you. I used to jump into a suit in 50 seconds, and I know what I'm talking about. And you, step by step, slowly turning yourself, you don't even know, to communists, if you're requesting to children wear the mask, they cannot smile, they cannot see each other, 
and they breathe all that garbage all day into the masks. Thank you, sir. And Thank I just telling you this, expired. this is the last. I'm telling you this, if my grandchild is going to be harmed, you're going to get lawsuits. Thank you. Done with you. Sherry Pickett, followed by Agretta Scott. Okay, Agretta Scott, followed by Ryan Newton White. Ms. Scott, as you approach the podium, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left to wrap it up. Thank okay. you. Welcome. Well, thank you. Good evening. My Good name evening. is Agretta Scott. My address is 6585 Bob White Lane. Um, yes, I am a Guilford County employee. I am a school bus driver. I am here on behalf to represent the school bus drivers. Um, my day starts at 3 a.m. in the morning. I leave my house at 4.35. I'm on my route at five, 10 after 5 every day. Some days I have four routes. Some days I have five routes. We are understaffed and underpaid. There are some of my coworkers who they don't do one route elementary, not two, but three every day. Not saying the middle school and then the high school. Then we have the learning hub. I am on the bus somewhere from 10 to 11, 12 hours a day. We never know what's gonna happen. On top of driving the bus, we have to deal with the discipline of the bus. On top of the discipline, we may break down and we need a mechanic, so that can throw, throw us off. I work for zone eight, which is Magnet East, so we have to hub, so we're on a time schedule. The kids need to get to the hub by 6.55. When they get to the hub, we need to have them, have them at their school on time. So we have a lot of things that we have to deal with, and we feel that our voice is not heard. We are overlooked. And so we, on top of all the other employees, mechanics, teachers, assistant teachers, office supports, nutrition, custodials, it's like a puzzle. We're all a part of a puzzle. And if you take one piece from that puzzle, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So I'm here. We do deserve the $4,000 bonus. And I'm just here to say, I just think that it needs to be some, you know, when you have your phone and it wants you to get an update and it won't let you go any further, we need to get some updates with the money for Guilford County. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your service. Ryan Newton White, followed by Shelley Doolin. As you approach the podium, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments. And when the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ryan Newton White, uh, and I live on Edinburgh Drive in Jamestown, North Carolina. I go attend Ragsdale High School as a junior. I would like to begin by thanking the board for allowing me to come here tonight and give you my comments. Uh, you do so much for this community, and I would just like to thank you for that. Now, I'm not here to specifically address mask mandates. What I am here to talk about is teacher pay. So I'm also here to talk about human decency and public discourse. It seems as though in this board, we see that the board, certain board members come to the table with their minds made up on certain issues. They know what they want the outcome to be on a certain particular issue, the most common one these days being teacher pay and this new bonus coming from the ESSER funds. It is, this school board is simply put, not a group that I would want our generation, specifically the people in my school, to look up to as an example of how decisions should be made. Instead of having conversations and, tru and truly hearing the other side, we come to the table with our minds made up, unwilling to hear compromise. It, it appears as though in, with nearly every decision, the school board stalls and simply kicks down the can down the road. Instead of trying to figure out how to pay teachers more, board members suggested that teachers are uh, using TikTok, uh, which I find extremely disrespectful that my mother is a teacher. She wakes up at four in the morning and gets ready to, to go to school where she has to teach dozens of uh, six and seven year old children and has to uh, make sure that they're behaving all day. And then she has to come home and get ready for the next day. Sometimes she doesn't go to bed till 10 o'clock at night. 
there seems to be a lack of perspective into the day, into the daily lives of present day teachers. Making comments like the ones that I've heard seem appear disrespectful to, the, to all teachers. They're struggling right now to do everything they can to help students who are struggling so much after the pandemic. Please remember that we are watching and we look up to you as our role models. Please remember that you are the ones we're supposed to look up to. And lastly, please keep in mind our students, our parents, and, last, and lastly, our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time to come and share your comments. Shelly Doolin, followed by Michael Logan. Ms. Doolin, as you approach the podium, um, please begin by saying your name and address, and you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you'll have 15 seconds left. Okay. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Shelley Doolin. I live on Elwood Avenue in the Glenwood neighborhood in Greensboro. I also teach second grade at my neighborhood school, Peck Elementary. I have worked for Guilford County Schools for a total of eight years, five of those at Peck. I am here this evening to encourage the board to provide substantial bonuses for all of our staff. I believe bonuses are necessary to not only retain staff, but to also show appreciation for the hard work of all educators employed by Guilford County Schools. If we learned anything from the pandemic, it was that our children's lives are improved by their daily interactions with their teachers. I believe we have established that our children's academic progress has slowed along with their emotional development, both long-term impacts of disengagement from school. I also think we know the key to improving outcomes for our students lies not in new technology or new curriculum, but with face-to-face -face instruction from educators. Children flourish when they feel secure, supported, and most importantly, loved. Nothing the district can purchase will take the place of our relationships with our students. Whenever I am challenged by a particular student, my EC educator husband always asked, well, have you built a relationship with them? Or what is your relationship with them like? It's infuriating to get the same advice every single time, but he is right. And I really hate to admit that. <laughs> he is always right. Positive relationships with adults are the foundation of childhood development and great classroom management. Who else can provide those relationships but teachers? All of the amazing educators I know have risen to that task over the last two years. They continue to show up for our district's children in spite of negative feedback from society at large. Apparently, we are somehow finding the time to indoctrinate our students while also trying to keep them in control in our classroom and an increase in challenging behaviors from our students. We keep coming back because we know our children need us. I also want to be clear that when I say educators, I mean every person who works in our schools. Our children form relationships with people throughout our buildings, from the front office staff to the school nutrition workers. Students are surrounded by people whose life work is to care for them and help them grow. They all deserve better pay, but while we wait for the state to fully fund our schools, a $4,000 bonus would make for a better holiday for everyone. So I must ask that the board please refrain from framing bonuses for educators as taking resources away from our students. We are the resources our students need, and the district should do whatever it can to stop the wave of educators who are leaving for greener pastures. We deserve recognition and compensation for our hard work. We have carried the emotional weight of worrying and caring for our district's children through a global pandemic. That is a burden that we willingly carry, but it is exhausting. So many of us are feeling burnt out and disrespected. A bonus won't fix our problems, but it will go a long way towards helping educators feel valued and appreciated. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. Michael Logan, followed by Austin Simmons. Mr. Logan, you've been in the room to hear my comments about um, your name and address and three minutes to give your comments. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Logan. I'm a Guilford County employee. I live at 5202 Rambling Road, Greensboro, North Carolina. Now, as I stand in or sit in this boardroom and watch, I would like to point out some observations. Cell phone use, computer use, unattended board members to speakers at the microphone. I'm a school teacher. I really don't like for my students to use the cell phones in the classroom because that's what they're focused on. When I sit here and watch this, it really kind of reminds me of a student that comes into my classroom 
And when I begin my class, pulls work out for another class and starts working on it because it's due the next period. But he's doing pretty good in my class, so he's going to go ahead and do the work that he failed to do in his other class. And he's playing catch-up. Now, I speak at several different functions and several different things. One thing I spoke at the other week was about public schools within Guilford County. And also there was some speakers about private schools and academies within Guilford County. I won't, And I learned a great deal because I listen. I listen. Opportunity scholarships. If we don't get our act together, it is going to kill us as a public school system. Because we won't be able to compete against that. A child in Guilford County can receive enough money to go to school between the opportunity scholarship. At first, I asked the man that was presenting, and I said, well, that doesn't cover it all. How is a family going to afford that even with the opportunity scholarship? And I thought about it later after I got home. I said, well, you know, you throw in that opportunity scholarship, $3,500 child tax credit, there's money left over in their pocket. And every child in Guilford County can go somewhere else other than Guilford County schools. Now, they cannot get the same opportunities that we offer within Guilford County schools because we have pathways that they cannot do and they cannot provide. But if our children cannot read and write, there is an issue there. At my school, Almost one out of eight students have a modification of read aloud, which means we read it to them. Now, I know as public educators, y'all understand what I mean. That is failing our kids. You should not be in high school and have to have stuff read to you. That is sad. And we are failing them if that is it. And there are other opportunities, and we need to step up our game. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, and thank you for your service. Austin Simons, followed by Cheryl Beeson. Welcome, Mr. Simons. You have, um, if you'll begin your comments by saying your name and address, you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Austin Simons, address 3906 Dogwood Drive. Members of the board, I'm here to speak to you today about an issue that is important to many individuals in the Grimsley community. I've stood by and actually listened to their comments and concerns. Have you? I've decided to stand here today and take action in support of the Grimsley community. Have you? What I have here tonight is a petition with over 500 signatures on it that says, save our baseball and softball fields. And if you don't think that 500 is a large number, then I suggest that some of you take a look at your margin of victory in your last election. You all have tried to censor us by ignoring the speaking requests of people that you knew were affiliated with Grimsley. And let me tell you, the Grimsley community will not stand by silently and let you destroy our baseball and softball fields. There are other, better options. We must rebuild smart. We already know that the Brooks building will be moving to the old Craven site. Afterwards, the new Kaiser location should be built there. A new school building should be built where the old Kaiser was. Then when repairs need to be made at Grimsley, if necessary, some students can temporarily move into the new school building at the old Kaiser location. This building will also serve a purpose of creating more room for our students um, as the schools continue to grow and become more overcrowded. But I shouldn't have to come here and say all of this. You all have said there are other options, but you refuse to engage in an open discussion about what these options are. Well, there is an option for you, and it is not only an option, but it is a solution. We must take time with this rebuild and do it strategically, not just planning for the present, but also planning for the future. 
This school board just voted to put a $1.7 billion school bond referendum on the ballot. Should you receive that $1.7 billion, which might I add is an exorbitant amount of money, you owe it to the taxpayers, students, parents, and teachers of Guilford County to use it wisely. I would also like to urge other school communities to stand with us in this fight because what can happen to one school can happen to any school. Sure, Kaiser is outdated, and don't get me wrong. I want to see improvements made, but those improvements should not come at the cost of Grimsley. An accommodation for one school should not negatively impact another school. All that does is turn one problem into another problem, and that gets us nowhere. These repairs will take time, but we will be here to support it as long as it supports us in full. This school has a deep importance to a lot of people in this county and beyond. We must keep our students and alumni engaged, and athletics is one of the best ways to do that. Don't mess that up. My family was made by this school. I've got whirly blood, and as a former student body president of this school, I can personally vouch for the spirit of it. If you mess with the whirly, you're going to get a whole whirlwind. These students deserve a fighter, and if you all won't fight for them, then I will. Thank you. Thank you. Cheryl Beeson, followed by George Rubenstein. Welcome. Um, please begin by giving your name and address, and you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Okay. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Beeson. My address is 3868 Eagleston Court in High Point, North Carolina. As a Guilford County Schools employee, <coughs> retiree, oops, uh, having spent 26 years in high school classroom before becoming an administrator, I come to you tonight on behalf of the amazing educators who are fighting every minute of every day to keep their heads above water on behalf of all of our students. The demands are, attent, are intense. Getting to know the students who've been traumatized by the effects of over a year of illness, isolation, financial uncertainties, shifting family responsibilities, and death all around them. We cannot teach those who we do not know and who recognize that we do not care about them as humans, but only as students. Teachers and other school leaders are learning how to support the social and emotional learning of needs of students in every school in Guilford County. Helping young people learn about self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making is, incre is increasingly important. I know many teachers in Guilford County Schools are also very thankful for the equity training that has been made possible in Guilford County Schools, again, to meet the needs of all of their students. Because many, students are, many schools are understaffed and substitute teachers are extremely difficult to come by, our teachers are spending their planning periods sometimes covering other classes, which is far less than ideal for the students' learning and for the teacher's ability to prepare their own lessons. When a teacher loses planning time, he and she loses the opportunity to collaborate with teammates about the week's, next week's lessons, meaning that the entire team will then have to devote more time after school to getting all of the teammates on the same page. And speaking of planning those amazing lessons, I am excited to thrill with you to, scare, to share with you some of the 2021 North Carolina teaching standards for social studies. The standards for all K-12 students resolve around the idea of applying inquiry models to analyze and evaluate social studies topics and issues in order to communicate conclusions and take informed actions. All North Carolina students, including those in Guilford County, even as young as the kindergarten through second grade, begin by formulating compelling questions and then gathering and evaluating sources. Beginning in the third grade, they develop claims using evidence and communicating ideas. And in high school, we have the opportunity to take and, and plan some informed action based on their questions. I'm here today to say that our students are, are very much in need of our teachers and school leaders and support, and we owe them all of our best. Thank you. Thank you. George Rubenstein, followed by Bonnie uh, Vanderwerken. Vanderwerken. 
Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Rubenstein. Um, please begin by saying your name and address. And uh, you have three minutes to make your comments. Uh, when the amber light comes on, you have 15 last seconds to wrap up your comments. Thanks. Thank you Thanks and welcome. I'm representing Smith, Ben L. Smith High School, so I just wanted to leave this. Oh, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> you brought your props is, with you. Sorry. My name is George Rubenstein, and I live at 5106 Ainsworth Drive in Greensboro. I'm a school counselor at the Ben L. Smith High School in Greensboro. We at Ben Smith ask to be set up for success. We want our students to be sitting, working, and thinking in safe conditions. We want our teachers to be in safe, healthy classrooms. We want our families to have access and abilities to use the same resources as any student in the county, regardless of zip code. Our school was built in 1963. There's a 29-year-old elevator built by National Wheel Elevator that is only accessible when you enter one side of the main building. They went out of business in 2012, so finding spare parts is very, very difficult. The elevator was originally supposed to go nine feet per minute. Now it's closer to nine inches per minute. It can hold 750 pounds. Cafeteria staff drive via golf cart one quarter mile around parking lots to enter the counseling rear entrance door to go to the main level to distribute breakfasts for the 300 and 400 hall classrooms. That's the upper level at Smith. When they want to go down to the first level, they can put their carts in the elevator, but they must go up and down the 17 stairs. There's not enough room in the elevator for cart and person. For our custodians, including one who's been working over 20 years and earns $12 per hour, they must put their equipment in the elevator as long as it is less than 750 pounds and walk up and down those same stairs. We see our custodians and cafeteria workers who have been worn down by the 21 months of constant demands. Moving furniture out of classrooms via that 29-year-old elevator to the auxiliary gym about a quarter mile away and arranging everything by classroom and hallway. Then returning that furniture carefully to the classrooms. Hundreds of trips and carts outside around the buildings and up and down the elevator. There are holes in the roof throughout our campus. In the IB office, there is a bucket catching gunk coming down from the ceiling. The walkway connecting A and B buildings does not protect people from rain and weather due to the holes. We have a pool that many schools in Greensboro use and many of the parents who come to the practices and meets speak with our administration about wanting to help the significant number of repairs to be made. We need to be set up for success. Our foreign language classes serve over 300 students and are taught in a 30-year-old trailer. The plumbing needs complete renovation. The commodes do not flush. We don't have hot water there. During COVID, you want people to wash their hands. We do not hear safety announcements in the trailer. There was recently a safety fence put up and the foreign language trailer is outside the perimeter of this fence. The air quality is poor with the aging HVAC system. We need to be set up for success. I used to work at High Point Central High School and I saw how they mobilized their community over a seven year period with the critical mass of Emery Wood and other concerned influential families that helped create change. If HPC can get renovated, why can't we? We need to be set up for success. Thanks very much for your time and your understanding and for your service. Thank you, and thank you for your service to our students and for a personal privilege to Ben Smith High School. By a double pancreatic cancer survivor, Colleen Abraham Katz, and she's got her own business, so I leave this with you guys. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Jorge Zabalos, followed by Stephanie Mitchell. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Bonnie Vanderwerker, followed by Jorge Sabalos, followed by Stephanie Mitchell. Welcome. As you approach the podium, just like to remind you to start with your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments when the amber light comes on. You have 15 seconds left. Thank you. I'm Bronnie Vanderwerker. I'm from Summerfield. I'm here once again to remind you that forcing our children to wear a mask in school all day holds implications for you. My granddaughter has terrible allergies. She told me the last time she was at my house that she sneezes in her mask every day. How many of you have had to do that? I suspect if I walked in here on any given day, I'd bet that you don't even wear your masks. I'm going to quote Dr. Jim Meehan, who's a preventative medicine specialist 
With over 20 years of experience and advanced training in immunology, inflammation, and infectious disease. The evidence is clear. Masks are ineffective, unnecessary, and harmful. What's happening today, including the misinformation surrounding community mask wearing, is about political agenda, symbolism, and fear, not science. Clearly, masks are a way to control the populace. Fear is the greatest tool in the hands of tyrants who want to control people. Long-term risk of mask wearing that you will be responsible for in our children. Self-contamination due to manipulation of the mask by contaminated hands or not being changed when wet, soiled, or damaged. Development of facial lesions, irritant dermatitis, or worsening acne. They're uncomfortable to wear. Wouldn't you agree? False sense of security. Difficulty in wearing them in hot and humid environments. It is simply not rational to believe that face masks will properly and studiously be worn by young children for up to 10 hours in a school day. Children are at an extraordinarily low risk of dying from COVID. Based on CDC published data, 99.99815% of children that contract COVID survive. What you're doing is unreasonable, unfounded, and frankly abusive and I believe it's all for power and money. I will not relent until you remove the mask from our children. And I don't believe that you have their best interest at heart by keeping them in a mask all day. Furthermore, why does Northwest High School look like a trailer park when this building and this room looks really good? Kind of wonder where the money came from for that. It appears to me that all school boards across America have forgotten that you were elected by us, that you worked for us, and that you've stripped us of all of our rights. We can't even walk in this building without going past police officers and going through a security check and handing our driver's license. We could vote easier than that. And yet we could probably walk in a school today because the schools aren't even safe. And I think it's time to take the mask off our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jorge Zabalos, followed by Stephanie Mitchell. Mr. Zabalos, as you, um, Reach the podium. Uh, I would like to ask you to begin with your name and address, and you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds to wrap up. Thank okay. you and welcome. Name is Jorge Ceballos. My address is 4028 Triton Trail, apartment 3H, High Point in North Carolina, 27265. Um, the reason why I'm here tonight is because I want to address the change in demographic of this country and the implications for education. I think most of us know that we are at the cusp of becoming a majority population of color country. Because of that, the implications for education are deep. One of those uh, implications is the reality that in that change of demographic, the educational system is required to prepare students for the world they're going to live in. And the world becoming more racially, ethnically diverse means that the students need to be prepared for that world. One of the ways in which we need to prepare the kids for that world is to actually give them a sense of the history that has built this country. So in order to have kids that are better prepared to live in a world that is more racially, ethnically diverse, it means that they need to understand the truth about how race and racism have impacted this nation. When you look at the history of this nation and you look at the fact, because it is a fact, that about 80% of the history of this country, we have lived under systems of legalized racial discrimination that's what colonization and slavery was, that's what Jim Crow was, 80% of the history of this country. That means that unless we teach that history and we teach the full truth of what happened during, that, during those years, we don't, don't have a real understanding of the place that we're standing on today because it would be a farce to say that 80% of the history doesn't matter today. It would be as if I were to tell you that 80% of your history doesn't matter in who you are today. You wouldn't agree with me on that. So the fact is that we need to teach 
the truth about race and racism in this country. Studies demonstrate that in educational environments that are more diverse and that actually see that diversity as an asset increase the academic performance of every student that is part of that experience. And that experience lasts 15 years beyond graduation. So that means that if we're not doing that, we're actually not preparing our kids for the world that is actually happening, turning as we speak. So for that reason, I commend Guilford School System because of its commitment to teaching truth, to seeing the diversity as an asset and seeing that it is their responsibility to build the capacity of the students to be in this diverse world. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Mitchell, followed by Misty Reagan. Ms. Mitchell, is you, uh, oh, no? Uh, Misty Reagan, followed by Ann Beatty. Thank you and welcome. As you noticed, Misty Reagan. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh huh. Yep. So, starting tonight, I noticed in the school board information link posted yesterday that portions of the um, requested $1.7 billion bond is that, um, subject to help create and maintain safe learning environments at all schools, including basic life safety improvements, school intercom systems, digital locks, and cameras. Those all sound like important items that should be invested in. But what have we done with the $10.8 million that was um, granted to the school system over the last four years? In 2018, county commissioners committed $10 million for increased safety and security. However, we know $1.8 million of that was spent on HVAC improvements. So what about the other $8.2 million? In 2019, the school system received a $500,000 federal grant to buy software and create an alert system. Where was that alert system? Why was there nothing like that in place at Southern Guilford in May of this year when seven people trespassed onto school property and assaulted a 14-year-old child while taking an exam? In 2020, the school system received another $275,000 in grants to, improve, to implement equipment for tracking visitors. But there haven't been any visitors in the school since May of 2020. So where did that money go? Yet here we are tonight, going into 2022, with $10.8 million in allocated funds, specifically for safety and security, upgrades, and not a single thing has been done. And here we are, again tonight, still having to walk through a metal detector, pass multiple armed officers into this room to speak. Meanwhile, our children are sitting ducks in these classrooms just waiting for a disaster to happen. There have been countless fights throughout the school system. Multiple calls for weapons found on campuses. Kids in hallways gathering around, watching their classmates, cheering them on while they beat the mess out of each other like a dog fight. Without a single peep from this administration about what's going on. No, this administration is too concerned with radicalizing, race baiting, and circulating stories to the media about pretend threatening emails. Well, where's the emails? The public wants to see them. So let's stop all the smoke and mirrors and let's talk about what's really happening in Guilford County. As of today, in Guilford County Schools, we've lost five students to gun violence. Since July, July of this year, three of the students have been shot, two murdered, one most recently as yesterday who was shot, a 17-year-old Grimsley High School student as he tried to attempt to rob a store. Another 17-year-old High Point team was arrested four days ago and is now facing charge eight charges, including murder. And let's not forget the 19-year-old former Page High School student that was arrested in July after being and is being charged with first degree murder, attempted robbery with a dangerous weapon, possession of a firearm by a felon. Correct, he was a felon because at age of 16, he, the young man had been in trouble for assaulting the high, his high school principal and later arrested for attempted robbery, but somehow released on a million dollar bond. What, so why he was on the streets at 6 a.m. on a Thursday morning, robbing a gas station over cigarettes. This board is complicit and our children are being used as pawns to promote, for, to promote your personal endeavors. Some of you have been sitting here for almost 20 years, uh, waiting and watching and waiting and stirring the pot. Enough is enough, no more dead kids, fix it. Thank you. Misty uh, Ann Beatty followed by Riley Driver. 
As you approach the podium, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments, and when the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds to wrap up your, your statement. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Ann Beatty. My address is 213 Kensington Road, Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm a parent of three children in GCS schools. I'm also a product of GCS schools, K through 12. And for the past 16 years, I've been a high school English teacher, um, the last eight of which have been in this district. I come to you tonight with this message. Our children are stronger and more resilient than we might think. We must teach our children the whole truth about our country's history of racial injustice. They are strong enough to handle this truth and they are hungry for it. When students realize they've not learned the full truth of our history, they feel betrayed. I understand this feeling of betrayal because attending schools here in the 1980s and 90s, I never once learned about the Greensboro Massacre or the Wilmington Coup of 1898. Although I knew about the Woolworth sit-ins, I did not learn much more than the fact that they happened. Our students deserve to know this local history. How will we move forward to solve the many problems facing us if we cannot be honest about the history to which we all belong? Trust teachers to teach the truth and discuss social issues without revealing or pushing our own political beliefs. Teachers know our job is to teach children how to think, not what to think. Trust us to have these important conversations with our students. In English education, teachers talk about mirrors and windows in the curriculum. Students should come to school and read literature that both reflects and expands their own experiences in the world. For far too long, white students, like my own children, have come to school and seen too many mirrors, not enough windows. Other children have come to school and seen too many windows, not enough mirrors. Shifting this balance is not about guilt or blame, it's a matter of honesty and increased understanding. Students yearn to talk about, as they call it, stuff that matters and their discussions are amazingly civil. Students don't all agree, but they can listen to each other and seek common ground. As teachers, we have an obligation to help them practice this skill. Let's believe in our students' resilience, compassion, and curiosity. To do anything less is to underestimate and underserve them. I came here tonight, although I do support teacher bonuses and the mass mandate in schools, to express my support for the board and the administration for everything you are doing to ensure that people in this district, both the adults and the students in our care, are thinking about how to create a shared future based on an honest understanding of the past with more opportunities for all students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service to our district and our students. Riley Driver followed by Susan Tysinger. Welcome, as you approach the podium, please give your name and address. Uh, you have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Riley Driver. Uh, I reside at 615 South Mendenhall Street. Um, and I'm an eighth year teacher uh, of ESL at Jamestown Middle School. It's a very good school. And like a lot of good schools, you can tell when you walk in, you can feel it. Um, people greet each other. When middle schoolers greet each other, that's great. <laughs> um, and there are smiles, and when things happen, people jump in and make it work every single day. It's obviously not perfect, um, but it's a really good place to work, and kids feel it too. And one of the things that kids are learning at school is what they can expect of their community, right? What is the world like outside of my house? Um, questions like, um, are people going to care about me? Uh, are things fair? Um, can I count on people to be there for me? Um, and the things that answer those questions, the structure that holds everything together, it's, it's not the building and it's not the curriculum and it's not uh, the technology and it's certainly not the standardized testing. It's the staff. It's the human beings that are holding that structure, that are making it exist, that are creating space for kids to learn and grow. Um, all of them, all of the people who do that. It's not just teachers. Um, it's office staff. It's custodians. And every person who works in a school knows this. And I'm here tonight because I'm feeling afraid, even in my very good school that's a great place to work, where we have a lot of veteran staff, people have been leaving. Uh, people have been retiring early. People have been burning out and leaving unplanned. Um, we've been short custodians constantly in the midst of a pandemic. It's a scary situation that we're in. And it's not just who's left already, it's who's tired. When I look around the people who are tired, it literally scares me because they're people who are experienced, who are skilled. It's not even just brand new teachers. 
Uh, it's not even just brand new staff. Um, folks are filling gaps uh, when people leave, when they were already stretched thin. Um, so it's clear that when we're asking for bonuses, it's not just financial, um, the stresses that people are under, but it would be a lie to say that that's not a major part of the choice that people make to continue to sacrifice uh, for their profession. Um, after a decade of cuts from the states, it's really clear that the situation we're in, the horrible choices that we're having to make uh, between things that our students certainly deserve, uh, we know that it's not the fault of this board. Um, but this one time that the board actually does have funds, this one time that the board actually does have funds, um, I really hope that you will use it uh, to address what those of us who work in a school feel like is the most imminent crisis that we're facing, which is that um, we can't keep losing staff like this and expect kids to be okay. There's no one coming um, to replace us. So I hope that you'll make a choice tonight to help people hang on, uh, to vote for a bonus to help our staff uh, stay for kids, not just as a symbol to signal that you see us, uh, but as a significant amount of money that, that can actually help us to hang on. Um, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your service to our students and to the district. Susan Tysinger, followed by Amelia Phillips-Hale. Welcome. As you approach the podium, uh, please begin by saying your name and address. You have three minutes to make your comments. When the amber light comes on, you have 15 seconds to wrap up. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I'm, I'm Susan Tysinger, and I'm, I'm from Greensboro, and I represent Take Back Our Schools. School districts all around have what many consider pornography in their schools. And we finally have the proof that you have joined those ranks. Why do I say finally? Because COVID has kept us out of our schools, kept us out of our media centers. Willing students and teachers feared, feared retribution, so they were not able to help us find things either. Parents have made repeated requests for reading lists, only to be told no. FOIAs have been sent in to find out how and where the money is being spent on websites and books. FOIAs ignored. One of the books we found was George, about a fourth grade boy who thinks he's a girl, expresses disgust over his genitalia, discusses sex change hormones and operations. Why is this book inappropriate? Because it's not something that should be discussed between a teacher and a student. This is a parent-child discussion. Inappropriateness is twofold. Content discussion should be at home, and the reading level is below grade level. Another one is, a, is The Breakaways, a graphic novel in more than one sense of the word. Fifth grade, misleads a potential reader as it looks like it's about a girl's soccer team, but then shows same-sex children in bed kissing passionately, discussing transgenderism. With very graphic pictures, I wouldn't want my kids seeing that of even if it was same sex or heterosexual. With, with also has very graphic pictures. I wouldn't want, um, and certainly no reading skills are enforced. It's on about a second grade level. If I were to walk across the street and give this book to a child, I'd probably be arrested for sharing pornography with children. Yet you put it in our media centers. Teaching sex, sexuality is not your job. It's, it's responsibility of the parent. When you folks get involved, it undermines the family unit. And anti-police books like Dear Martin, at a time when we need our police more than ever, when we depend on law enforcement to provide security and safety for our students, why do you want to portray our police in such a negative light? Fights are breaking out in schools all over the county. And you continue your anti-police narrative, undermining teachers and police authority. And here you are, sitting surrounded by police protection and metal detectors. Let us know how to find out the names of these books we have in questions and where they are. Let us know when you will respond to our FOIAs so we will know how you are spending my tax dollars. Those of you with young children, would you like for me to take your children, teach them my religion or lack thereof, share pornography I deem suitable, incur my belief system on them, control their opinions by sharing mine as the only truth? I think not. 
Stop hiding the truth. Stop hiding what's being taught and where our money is going. If you ever decide you want a successful school system where children can actually learn to read and write and do math, it'll have to start with honest communication with the parents. Thank you. Thank you. Amelia Phillips-Hale is our final speaker. Welcome, and as you approach the podium, please begin by saying your name and address. Uh, you have three minutes to make your comments when the amber light comes on. You have 15 seconds left. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Amelia Phillips-Hale, and my address is 421 Crestland Avenue in Greensboro, and um, I am a parent of a GCS fourth grade student. Um, thank you. I wanted to say thank you for your efforts to keep the students, teachers, and staff of Guilford County supported and safe. Um, I also wanted to say thank you for working to address racial disparities within our schools and for teaching accurate and relevant history. When I asked my fourth grader why she thinks it's important to learn our true history, um, both good and bad, she said, because it's kind of like when you make a mistake and you want to fix it in the future, and if we learn our true history, then we cannot make those mistakes again. And if we can't look at our mistakes and try to fix them, it will probably just keep happening again. With a complete view of the past, students become more responsible citizens. A shared, honest understanding of the past bridges divides and helps students become critical thinkers across differences and disagreements. Thank you for following public health informed policies, such as masking and test mandates for unvaccinated students and school personnel Wearing masks at school provides us the freedom to visit high-risk relatives and feel safer. Our family was able to celebrate our daughter's granddad's 70th birthday and her great-grandmother's 93rd birthday this fall, which made us very happy. Thank you for being champions for our children and our community. The board's commitment to excellent schools for our children and their families and their courageous efforts to build school policy and actions that reflect this truth are awe-inspiring. We continue to stand with you all in your efforts to fulfill GCS's mission to graduate responsible citizens and represent GCS's core values of diversity, empathy, equity, innovation, and integrity. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our um, public comments portion of the agenda. We are now at approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we are now at the consent agenda. Actually, I was going to, yeah, because several of us didn't answer there. Um, I was actually going to see if there was a possibility. I'm sorry. On the right button. I was going to see if we could potentially move the line item about the bonuses before we address the budget. Could we do that? Would anybody have a problem with that? Um, you can make that motion and we can see if that passes to move the um, staff bonuses discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find that yeah, number good. at the moment. Yeah. Mrs. Yeah. Knapp, I think it would be difficult to have that discussion without discussing the budget. So that's item nine, I believe. Yes, yeah. item nine. And the uh, budget, is item budget eight. resolution was 8C. So is there a second to that motion? Second. I'll second. Okay. Um, Anita? Aye. Deborah? Aye. Betty? No. Gina? Oh, I'm sorry. Winston? No, I'd like the context of the budget first. Okay. Um, Linda? Yes. Pat? Yes. I don't think it, I don't think they're mutually exclusive and I think we could have a conversation about the bonuses without any recklessness. So. Uh, Linda? I'm sorry, Diane? No. And Dina, no. So I think that's a tie. So the motion doesn't pass and it will remain item nine. So um, we are now back at the motion to approve the agenda. No, it's the whole agenda because they didn't vote on it um, the first time because they wanted to have that on there. So Anita? 
Deborah? Yes. Betty? Yes. Winston? Yes. Linda? Yes. Pat? Yeah. Yes. Diane? Yes. And Dina? Yes. Uh, that passes by a vote of? Six to two. Six to two. Whenever somebody's missing, my math messes up. All right, thank you. We are now at um, the consent agenda, Dr. Contreras. What's that? Um, I, uh, board member Irby um, had to leave uh, to attend a performance uh, for her son, and I believe she is going to try to call in. I'm not sure if the um, activity has ended and she's able to do that. So, Kim, would you um, see if you can um, just monitor that to see when she's able to join us? Okay. Thank you. Good agenda. evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. This evening's consent agenda includes approval of the November meeting minutes, the personnel report, naming of Western Guilford Middle School cafeteria, the sewer easement for Florence Elementary School in the city of High Point, the chiller and cooling tower replacement at Ferndale Middle School, and the chiller replacement at Jackson Middle School. That concludes this evening's consent agenda for your consideration. All right, if you would please, um, well, let's see. I'll just do this one by one. Anita? Um, no on B, yes on the others. Okay, Deborah? Madam Chair? Yes. Betty? Yes. Winston? Yes. Linda? Pat? Yes. Van? I wanted to call the personnel, but if I can just ask a question before I vote, you know. That's fine. Okay. Um, in the personnel report, uh, I see that you have listed the uh, certified uh, employees who get hired. Is there a way to know? Uh, I know that we're struggling to have um, to, to, to hire people who come in as lateral. Is there a way to uh, identify who those folks are so that we see uh, what we're dealing with? Because everybody who you're hiring as a teacher, some of them still have to go through their own sort of go through certification or, or get their, they have a temporary license, right? Thank you, Dr. Morrison. If you can come to the podium and answer. individuals who are are hired as as teachers yeah as teachers but have, have to have like a license a lateral, but they, they get you, you, ref, you refer to it as the lateral entry okay. license but it is a, an approved license by the state of north carolina all teachers in the public school setting must have a an approved license so even mm -hmm. though you may say that they have not gone through a teacher ed program they in fact um have met the requirements by state law um to uh, teach uh, with the understanding that they will be taking additional coursework to complete a, a, a comprehensive okay. license. Okay, if you don't mind, just tell me what, uh, explain that, you know, what happens. A person who, who is not... You have a degree in science. Okay. And maybe you're working for LabCorp. And you decide, gee, I really want to make a difference for children. So I want to teach. Um, the state of North Carolina indicates that because you have a degree in science, they will allow you to come into the school setting and become a classroom teacher. They will require you to take additional coursework, pedagogy, you know, you maybe have not had a course on how to deal with discipline. So you would take, an addition, take additional coursework. I mean, the number of hours required depends on how many courses you've had in, the, in your um, pursuit of your degree but they do consider you licensed. It's just as a, a term in the past was lateral entry. Okay. So you've come in by way of um, the non-traditional method. Okay. Like a student teacher would. Okay, like, but in, like in your last report, is there a way for you to, to know how many of those, cert, those folks that you hired, what percentage? Yeah. It's additional work, but yes, there is a way to know. Okay, um. I mean, I don't wanna make you do additional work. What, what I'm trying to do is to uh, make it aware of the fact that, you know, we're doing different ways or different approaches to actually put more uh, teachers 
in our classrooms. So that's why I was asking, you know, was there, I mean, and, and if it, I don't want to be, you know, all I want is for us to know that this is what we're, we're dealing with. Do. I've heard the, the superintendent say that like 57% of yeah. all new hires. We'll work with the superintendent too. Mm -hmm. We'll work with the superintendent too. Um, see if we can address that. Okay. Do you understand what, what yes, I'm asking? Yes, I understand. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank then, you. Then my vote is yes. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out. Is Board Member Irby? Um, um, I think Ms. Funderburg said she. Dr. Funderburg said she needs a break to set up the conference line. Miss Irby is trying to get up on the conf get on the conference line, and she didn't know she was trying to call in. Okay. So let's just finish this, and then we'll get her in. Okay, Diane. Okay, great. No problem. Thank you. So, uh, and Dina, yes. So items A and C through F pa um, passed unanimously, a vote of eight to zero. And item B um, passes by a vote of seven to one. We are now at, um, well, we'll just take our break and let Dr. Funderburg try to um, get board member Irby connected. Thank you for your patience. She needs a comp. She doesn't have a conference. Madam Chair, are we taking a recess We're just, briefly, well, um, or just? A mini break. Okay. So. I didn't know if you wanted to just. We can. That's fine with a, me. If you want to take, take a break, five. I know we've been at it for about two hours. So, um, so we'll recess um, for about ten minutes while we yeah. get that hooked up. No, Try to come back at eight twenty. That's eight minutes. That'd be perfect.
Welcome, Ms. Irby. You are now, um, we're just beginning uh, our action items, and we are at universal face coverings and our mask requirement that right now um, require a monthly vote. Uh, very pleased to have Dr. Yulia Van, with the, uh, who is the director of the Guilford County Department of Public Health with us. Welcome, Dr. Van. Look forward to hearing your presentation. All right, let's see. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I know it's been a while since um, I've seen all of you, so thank you for having me um, here and allow me to provide an update and information on COVID-19 um, and the um, and a, a few pieces of information. So I'm going to cover, um, I'm going to go over some of the data and metrics um, for COVID-19 for Guilford County. I'm also going to provide you an update on what is the information that we know at this point around the Omicron variant. Um, also a little bit about the flu update. I know that there was um, a speaker from the floor that mentioned that. So I will um, just briefly mention what is going on with the flu season. Also some updated information and in research studies around around mask um, effectiveness and also um, in that conversation, some of the protocols that we're following right now for uh, masking and case investigation and contact tracing. So with that being said, I'll start talking a little bit about the metrics and where we are for Guilford County. Um, we are seeing, as far as the new cases are concerned, we are seeing approximately 150 new cases every day. Um, that this has been a spike starting the beginning of last week. Um, now it's slowly decreasing, but not um, drastically like we would like it to, to happen. It's probably most likely due to the fact that we are moving into a colder weather. Um, respiratory viruses like colder weather. They like um, less humidity. They transmit easier during this time of the year. We're also moving indoors, and we're also after the Thanksgiving holiday and the gatherings that were happening at that time. So that is uh, one of the some of the reasons why we believe that this particular spike has happened at the beginning of last week. When we are also looking at the distribution by age, um, overall the cases in Guilford County in the school age children have been approximately 15%. So 15%, if we're looking at the overall cases, have been in school-aged children. In the last 30 days, when we're looking at that age distribution, 22% of the new cases have been in school-aged children. So we knew that Delta has been affecting our younger population, and that continues to be the case since we continue to see Delta as the predominant variant in the community right now. When we're looking at the positivity rate, um, our 14 days average positivity rate is 8.1% as of yesterday's data. So calculating 14 days from yesterday going backwards. So that is December 13th through January through November 29th. So 8.1%. And then when we're looking at the single day positivity rate, um, the most recent day is 10.6%. So this continues, this metric also continues to um, to go up and it's been going up over the last couple of weeks. That is also paired with the fact that we are seeing a decrease in testing that is being that are being performed in the community. We are seeing approximately 800 tests done a day um, compared to approximately 2,500 tests that were performed every day um, in September and October. So I'm bringing the tests up because positivity rate is directly proportionate to the number of tests that are being performed. And also hospitalizations, as of today, we have 77 um, individuals that are being hospitalized with COVID-19 related um, illness in both of our um, health systems, both Cone Health and Wake Forest Baptist, compared to approximately 40 individuals being um, hospitalized two weeks ago. And um, we do have less than five individuals in the hospital that are school-aged children at this time. Um, according to the information that I've received from our Cone Health partners right now. When it comes to the vaccines, um, total population that is partially vaccinated, 62.62%, uh, 62%, fully vaccinated, 58%. And when we're looking at the five years and older age population, we are at 65% fully, uh, partially vaccinated, 
partially vaccinated and 62 percent uh, fully vaccinated. Now, we are starting uh, vaccinating our uh, younger population, our pediatric population, starting vaccinated kids five, five and older. So when we're looking at that age demographic, we know that 28,000 children in Guilford County has been, have been fully uh, partially vaccinated and 23,000 fully vaccinated. That represents 4.4% of our total population in, in Guilford County. So only 4% of our, um, of the children, the children that have been vaccinated represent 4% of our population right now. I also like to uh, mention the fact that the um, most of the cases are also, ha- or the, a lot of the cases are also happening in the school age children. So that concludes the part that I wanted to uh, talk about as far as data and metrics. When we're um, talking about the Omicron variant, there's still a lot of uh, data that needs to be gathered. However, we do have some initial information that we can share with you tonight. Um, we know that it has more than 50 mutations in different portions of the of the virus. The majority of those are in the protein that is the key to the vaccine. So at this time, we anticipate that is going to probably evade our immunity or the immune system a little bit more than what Delta was able to do. So... Um, there's still a lot of information that needs to be gathered. All of the, these studies are being done in the laboratory uh, setting right now. So they're being expe- uh, expanded more to the real world um, information, but still the ability to evade the immune system. And um, it, it's really concerning because that's where our vaccination process is, is really important. And that's why we continue to um, engage our community in not only starting their series if they haven't done it so, but also receiving receiving their booster shot. Um, that is really important as we're moving into the, the fall and in, I mean, to the winter and the Christmas holidays, the, um, the winter holidays. Also, we know that um, there are some mutations that may um, make it a little bit more transmissible. Um, there, that is not entirely clear at this time, um, but it has rapidly replaced Delta in South Africa. It is also moving to rapidly replace Delta in United Kingdom in approximately two Two weeks, the majority of the cases in United Kingdom are going to be Omicron, and we know that it is already here in the United States, it's here in North Carolina, and we're working a few cases here in Guilford County as well, with no confirmation, but potential um, Omicron variants as well. Um, the severity, we have initial information, which is uh, fairly optimistic, that is not going to be more severe than Delta. But we know that Delta is a severe variant, so uh, that is also an area that we need to continue to um, look at. Um, The impact on treatment. So we are utilizing uh, monoclonal antibodies or MABs right now to make sure that uh, those individuals that qualify to get it, um, uh, they get this treatment so they can stay out of the hospital. It prevents hospitalizations. It prevents uh, morbidity. Um, and the Omicron may not be as successful or uh, the treatment may not be as successful with the with this particular variant. We know that the antiviral treatments that we are hearing a lot about um, these days might not be impacted. So that uh, that's a pretty good um, uh, news there. Um, and diagnostic tests, tests that is not going to be impacted. The tests are going to continue to be very um, um to the point they're going to be able to detect the virus regardless of the variant. Um, Also, um, moving into the information around masks and um, some of the recent studies and information that has been shared with us, um, just today, um, we've received information from the North Carolina DHHS around a study that has been conducted here in North Carolina between October 10th and December 7th. Um, of course, these numbers are still pre- preliminary and uh, the research study has not been um, yet publicized, but these are some of the initial, um, some of the initial data that was gathered during this, and it was in, in collaboration with the ABC Collaborative. So 21 of the 46 districts that have optional mask policies reported um, a cluster during the time frame that the study has been compared, uh, that has been used compared to six of the 65 districts um, that have a mandatory mask policy. 
Among the counties that reported a K-12 cluster during this period, there was an average of 7.2 clusters per 100 schools in counties where masks were optional and 2.4 clusters per 100 schools in counties where masks were mandatory. So that represents a threefold difference uh, comparison between counties that have a mask mandate in place. And um, so there's a, a big difference between um, the, these um, districts and the clusters that have been identified based on uh, what have been their policies and their protocols around masking. Again, this is probably going to become um, more mainstream information as North Carolina DHHS is going to start sharing that information. I've received um, approval from the state epidemiologists to share this information with you tonight since I've shared with them that I was going to come and speak um, tonight. Also, I wanted to bring forward to the board uh, the new science brief that is available on the CDC's website, um, and it uh, talks about the community use of masks to control the spread of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, I'd like to um, start by uh, reminding all of us what are some of the uh, ways that the masks are uh, being utilized and why uh, where uh, the CDC, the North Carolina DHHS, and your local health department recommend community use of masks to prevent transmissions of SARS-CoV-2. Mas masks are primarily intended to reduce the emission of the droplets by the wearer, which is called source control, which is especially relevant for asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic infected wearers who feel well and may be unaware of their infectiousness to others. Masks also help reduce inhalation of these droplets by the wearer, which is called filtration for wearer protection. The community benefit of masking for SARS-CoV-2 control is due to the combination of these two effects, both source control and filtration for wearer protection, and individual prevention of benefit increases with increasing number of people using masks consistently and correctly. Um, this particular science brief also mentions a variety of different studies and a variety of different research that has been done around masks. I would like to focus on three particular ones that are being mentioned here that are really uh, they're relevant to the conversation that this board is going to have tonight. A study examining SARS-CoV-2 secondary attack rates among, uh, among eight public K-12 school districts in Massachusetts. Um, this represents 70 schools with more than 33,000 enrolled students during the school year of 2020-2021. 2020, um, school year found that that particular infectivity rate um, was 11.7% for unmasked students versus 1.7% for, uh, for um, masked students. The second study that is mentioned in this um, brief, during the July 15 through August 31st, 2020, when Delta was the predominant strain and continues to be that um, circulating in the United States, about one in five K-12 public non-charter schools open for in-person learning in Maricopa and Pima counties in Arizona, experienced a school-associated outbreak. Um, so only one in five K-12 schools um, experienced a school-associated outbreak, and outbreaks were three and a half times more likely in schools without a mask mandate. And the third study that I wanted to mention is that in a nationwide analysis of data collected during July 1st through September 4th, uh, United States counties without school mass requirements experienced larger increases in pediatric COVID-19 case rates, 18.53 per 100,000 per day more cases after the start of the school compared with counties with no um, school mass requirements. There is additional information in the brief, uh, but I've selected those particular three uh, based on the, um, the conversation tonight. I also um, like to mention the fact, and this is the, the last piece of information here, is that um, 
there have been several studies that are addressing potential adverse health effects of mask wearing in children. And I would like to, uh, to mention a few of them. A study of elementary school children reported no adverse cardiovascular or pulmonary ox, um, effects among children while wearing a cloth face covering in a classroom for 30 consecutive minutes of instructional time. A separate study observed no oxygen desaturation or respiratory distress after 60 minutes of monitoring among children less than two years of age when masked during normal play. In a prospective school-based cohort study of children aged 10 to 17 years who wore masks for six to seven hours during the school day, some children self-reported some um, uh, a side effects such as skin irritation, headache, or difficulty breathing, that was 2% of self-reported um, uh, side effects. Also, a study of 7 to 13-year-old children determined that um, uh, the decrement in, in emotional interference observed when the lower half of a photograph face was covered with a mask was equivalent in that associated with covering the eyes with sunglasses, leading the authors to conclude that in combination with the contextual cues, masks are unlikely to produce serious impairments of children's social interactions. Also, a study of two-year-old two children concluded that they were able to recognize familiar words presented without a mask when hearing words without, throughout, uh, through opaque masks. And the last one here, among children with autism spectrum disorder, interventions including positive mask reinforcement and coaching by caregivers and teachers have um, improved participants' ability to wear masks, with these funding, uh, findings suggesting that even children who may have difficulty wearing a mask can do so effectively through targeted interventions. And there is additional information in this brief with each and every one of these studies that I have mentioned listed here um, for reference, um, and I'll be more than happy to make this uh, document available to the board if the board would like to um, receive that information. And as far as the flu updated, I mentioned um, we are starting to see an uptick in flu cases. It's probably going to, it's, it's the marking of our 21-22 uh, flu season. We're seeing a lot of influenza A um, type at this point, which in previous seasons have been um, um, associated with more um, more illness with more se uh, with severe uh, more severe symptoms um, associated with the flu. So, um, if you have not received your flu so, um, vaccine so far, I would definitely encourage everybody to to do so. And the last point is around um, the protocols around case investigation and contact tracing in the schools. Um, at this point in time, if we are um, having a positive case that is considered uh, that. Um, person that is exposing others, if we're having mask on mask exposure, those children are not excluded from schools. Um, that is part of the North Carolina um, uh, Safe School Toolkit and uh, Guilford County Health Department is following those guidelines when it comes to um, excluding children from school um, if there are a close contact to somebody in, in their classroom. But if we identify the fact that they have been wearing their masks successfully during the day, they're not being excluded um, according to that guidelines. So that concludes my updates in the presentation. And at this point, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Dr. Van. Diane. Dr. Van, are children dying of COVID? We do not have any child in Guilford County that has died of COVID, fortunately, but there have been uh, numerous um, information across the United States and the world of children dying of COVID, yes. Okay, so, so COVID is killing children too? Yes, absolutely. All right, because, uh, and the reason why I ask you that is because I think one of our speakers kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, it was it was not that bad. But to, I, I would think that any child is it, to the family who, whose child that was. So children can get very sick and can die of COVID. That's correct. Okay. Um, my next question, uh, and this probably is to uh, our, our staff, to Dr. Contreras. 
when we have a kid who has a soiled mask or he drops it on the ground, whatever, do we, um, do we have access to provide them with a clean or new mask? Are you asking, do we have access to masks for students? Yeah, if, if a, because I keep hearing folks saying, well, the child's mask gets dirty and it gets snotty and it gets all this, but we, we will, if that child needs it, provide them with a fresh or clean mask. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. In every school, we have uh, mask, gloves, all the PPE uh, equipment uh, that uh, students should have. Now, I have to say, when I've gone into classrooms, however, I have not always seen the additional mask. And I have asked where it is, and the principal has gone and said, well, the teacher hasn't asked for it, et cetera. But it's in the school, and they've gone down to the office or wherever they keep it uh, to get it. But every teacher should keep additional mask on hand, and it shouldn't just be in the office in a storage closet. Okay. And then my last question, and I don't know if you can answer this, but we've had school districts around us who, uh, in the months of November, uh, I think in October, November, probably November, who uh, um, took away their mask mandate. And then they wound up having to go back and put it back in place. Am I correct? I'm not, um, I'm not sure. completely um, clear on that, so I would not like to provide any wrong okay. information. Okay. But it, what you are saying is that there's a greater risk of exposure if kids or people are not wearing masks in our, in our schools. Yes, that's correct. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. That is a higher risk of um, transmission when the masks are not being worn um, appropriately, correctly, and consistently. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to add one other thing to the second question that you asked me around, um, or the first one, around the children that have died of, um, of COVID-19 and the fact that we have not lost any child in Guilford County due to COVID-19. I'm very proud of all of the work that has been done in Guilford County. And I think that one of the very difficult things in public health is to measure things that did not happen based on the prevention and the measures that have been put in place in order for those things not to happen. Thank you. Thank you. De Deborah, then Pat. Yes, and thank you for not taking a guess at how bad it could possibly be. I don't even want to think about it. Um, I wanted to go back to the very beginning of your comments, if you don't mind, when you said that 4% of the children in the county have been vaccinated fully at, uh, I want to say, 23,000, you said? Yes, 23,942 children are between the ages of 5 and 17 have been fully vaccinated. Unfortunately, the DHHS data did not allow me to add the 18-year-olds in there as well, sure. um, but that has been the best um, age group that I was able to provide for and uh, that, the meeting tonight. I'm sorry, is that us here in Guilford? Yes, or, Okay. that and is Guilford County specific. What date did we start administering vaccine to that age group? I know it's been a little bit different from, from county to county, so do you know that off the top of your head? I believe it was the first week in November, and if I remember correctly, it might have been probably November 8th because that was my birthday, and gotcha. we started <laughs> vaccinating kids that day. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. And so what I'm seeing here is that in the course of roughly four weeks, we have vaccinated 23,000 children in this age group, and that is absolutely fantastic, and that I think very, very clearly says that the interest and the want for the vaccine for this age group is there and I'll be honest with you, with my own children, I've been working on that, and it's, I've had trouble finding appointments because things have been so full, and I really think it would behoove us to give families more time to get children in this age group vaccinated because that, that, that's a lot of numbers to move, especially with pediatric patients who, you know, might not be crazy about the idea of another shot. Um, <laughs> so that is that is incredible work thank you nearly twenty four thousand. and i would like to see that number go up and i would like to give families the opportunity to get their hands on that vaccine for their children thank you pat thank you dr van um yeah i want to get back to you mentioned 
I think you, I think the word you used was several children have died. Um, and on, on those deaths, I mean, and look at the statistics, how it is so rare. I mean, it is rare given the, if you look at the larger numbers of age population that have sadly um, died. Those children, do we know, I mean, was that strictly COVID related or, or do we know if there were underlying health uh, issues um, related to that? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I do not have that information since the majority of the data is outside. I mean, all of the data is outside of the county since we have not experienced any deaths here in Guilford. Um, reading the studies, reading the information, there have been um, a lot of situations in which the children have passed due to COVID and there were no underlying health conditions. Mm -hmm. And there have been also circumstances in which COVID-19 have um, built on top of those comorbid comorbidities that they've had. So I think that there's um, both of those situations, but I cannot um, give you exact um, information on, on that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I've got a few questions, so I'll just try to get through these quickly. Um, sure. And, uh, and those children that had, had died, was that prior to vaccinations that were, because I know vaccinations have been going on for four or five weeks. Those, did those, were they vaccinated, those children? Well, the, in, I'm I mean, talking the about since the beginning of the pandemic. Right. So we're talking over the last so, almost two years now, right. we've lost kids to COVID-19. Prior to, but, so they weren't vaccinated. That's correct. They we did not have a vaccine the first yeah, year. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, and what, what, and help me understand, what's a, what is a cluster? I probably should know that as much as we've been dealing with this issue, but what, what it, maybe there's a lot of maybe there are people watching or listening that don't what is a cluster can you what, what does that mean yes yeah, sure so a cluster is defined as five or more cases in one area that ha can be epidemiologically linked to each other so that means that there's some type of um, connection between these cases that tell us that they have been all exposed to either the same person or they've been exposed to each other and one of them um, was infected and now the other ones are infected. So cluster is the term that is being used in areas such as schools, schools, other congregate living facilities, uh, business offices, and so on and so forth. We're also utilizing the term outbreak Outbreak is a different definition, and it means more than two cases that are linked in some type of healthcare setting, uh, nursing home, long-term care facility, hospital, um, office, doctor's office, and so on and so forth. So because we're in the school setting, we're utilizing the cluster terminology, which is five or more cases that are linked to each other. Yeah. Let me ask you this. If in your, in your professional medical opinion, um, do you think that it's uh, highly risky if, if, if parents um, on a very limited basis and their mask, let's say, and they've been vaccinated um, to come into the schools and volunteer? Do you think that's unsafe? Uh, to allow parents to come in the school? Is that what you're asking me? Right. I mean, to come in and uh, participate and help you know, whether it be in the office or uh, help read some of those things that parents often do and particularly in K through five, there's a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, what, I mean, is that unsafe? Or, I mean, what's, what's yeah. So from my perspective, every type of um, activity or mitigation strategy that is going to decrease the risk of transmission in any type of setting is better not to take place. But of course that is the decision of this board and the superintendent on how exactly that is going to be done. Right. Even though those folks may be going to Home Depot on the weekends and the malls, and, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out like where the inconsistencies kind of, um, I just have trouble with that. I cannot dictate where everybody goes. And right, but I mean, w w you would probably guess that on weekends people are traveling, they're going to restaurants, they're maybe going into a grocery store. I mean. So I'm my recommend, or my not recommendation, but my perspective as a public health professional is that limiting any type of high risk activity, limiting mixing of individuals, exposing different individuals to each other is the best, pra the, the best case, um, best practice when it comes to infectious disease. Right, okay. Um, and, and one other, Sisig, um, you mentioned 
um, 800 per day were, were, were being tested now, I think currently, versus there was a much larger number. Uh, to approximately 2,500 tests a day. Right. Yeah, well, how do you, how do we, how do, how do we, how do you, how would you explain that? Is that because that more people are vaccinated or they're not as fearful or, I mean. Why how, less the, people are being tested? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that is because um, there, there's, I, I guess there's a variety of different reasons behind that because it's not availability and it's not um, the fact that tests are not there. Um, we know that the, the fluctuation in people wanting to get tested depends on what's going on in the community and in their own lives. So we know that in, um, in the situation before the holidays, people tend to go and get tested more and they want to go and get that test in order for them to travel or um, have activities with, with their families. And then after that, um, most people are going to get tested because they're symptomatic. So it's not about the fact that they don't feel like they need to get tested or more people uh, are not interested in getting tested. It's the fact that the symptoms are the ones that were, uh, exposures are the ones that are driving more people to go and get tested. So if I know that I have not had any exposure to anybody, I'm not traveling anywhere, I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary, I'm not symptomatic, I'm probably not going to go and get tested. But if I know that I'm going to visit my grandma next week, I am going to get tested. Or if I'm starting to, to exhibit some type of um, symptoms. So that is the reason why I mentioned the tests because they're directly uh, proportional with the positivity rate. It is more likely to identify positive cases when those that are seeking testing are seeking testing because of symptoms or exposure. Do you think it could be that more people are vaccinated, therefore there's just not as many symptoms? Well, that is also a reason why, yeah. you know, uh, that could be why we're seeing less tests done, but we were at a very similar vaccination rate about two, um, about a month ago, because our vaccination rate has not increased tremendously over the last month, but yet we were seeing 2,500 tests a day. So that might not be the main reason why that's happening. And so the 2,500 to 800, that was in, that was what I was trying to get to. That was within a month. That no, a, a day. A day. Oh, a day. A day. Okay. Yes. Thank you, because I, I was trying to take good notes, and I missed that part. Sure, no problem. Yeah, I know I, I threw out a lot of yeah, numbers. No, that's okay. Um, and, out of, and last one. Um, thank you, everybody, for being patient. The 150 per day, you said that's the current uh, cases? I New think, cases every day on the average. It's right, not average. exactly. One day might be 120. The next day might be 160. Sure, that's the average, yeah. Right. And and of the of of those, um, what was the school age number? I think there was a percentage. Yes, in the last thirty days, mm -hmm. twenty two percent of the new cases have been in school age children, compared to our overall cases over the entire time of the pandemic, which has been about fifteen percent. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, Betty, and then Kim. And with that number, you have 4.4 students that have been vaccinated, correct? That is out of the total county population, yes. Okay. Well, um, looking at your numbers that you mentioned also, um, 77 that's hospitalized, but two weeks ago was 40. That's correct. So that's almost double. So my question to, I guess, Dr. Contreras is, if we had an outbreak or oh, I'm sorry, a cluster in the schools. Give me a scenario, what would happen if we had a cluster in the school? Well, it depends on how many individuals the public health department would indicate have to be quarantined. So if um, individuals are generally masked, it's more limited in terms of, and you'll have to help me with your the guidance. I don't know it as well as you do. Absolutely. But apparently the more masking you do, the fewer people have to be quarantined. 
when you're not masked or when it's optional, you have to quarantine more, which led to what Mrs. Bellamy Smalls mentioned with the issues with schools having, school districts having to reverse themselves because they didn't have enough teachers to teach. It led to the substitute, more of the substitute crisis. Okay, what would constitute um, whether a mass of kids, a mass of kids um, being sent home or a school shutdown, what would constitute that? As the as ability, to, so for uh, several things. One, do we have enough teachers? So if the teachers are all being quarantined, we might have to shut the school down. Or if the majority of students are being quarantined, we would have to shut school down as well. And most, the most likely, that's maybe kids that are going from one class to another class because it's spreading, right? No, it can happen in an elementary school as okay. well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kim, and then Anita. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to know what happens when we do have a situation where a family member is tests, you know, has COVID, and how does that impact a student and them accessing school? I believe that there are um, a couple of scenarios. One, is the student vaccinated or is the student unvaccinated? If the student is vaccinated and the parent is positive, the student can continue to come to, work, to, come to school um, unless they're exhibiting symptoms. That exposure to the parent um, is not a, a reason for them not to come to, and continue to come to school. We're not quarantining vaccinated individuals after an exposure. Of course, we're recommending, if possible, that child to maybe um, stay with another family member during this time, or maybe the, the parents in the household can uh, limit the exposure to that particular individual who's possible, but I know that uh, positive, but I know that that's not always possible. So that is the benefits of being vaccinated, the fact that we are not requiring those um, children to um, quarantine. If they're not vaccinated, then they have to stay in quarantine for a, an amount of time, depending on what is the last day of exposure to that positive parent. So if that parent continues to expose the child during their um, isolation period, that child may stay uh, in quarantine for up to 21 days um, depending on what the situation is. So it's really difficult for me to give you an example um, or examples of every single type of scenario, but overall that would be the, um, the situation. So why is it the, the 21 days? Can you go back and clarify? Because that's a long time yeah. for a student to not access going to school and having, you know. Yeah, and that situation has not really happened um, too much, but I know that it has happened. So. When we're talking about the last day of exposure, so let's use the scenario in which we have a parent that is positive and we know that they're in, they need to stay in isolation for at least 10 days from the day that they found out that they're positive. So that is today. So they need to stay in isolation for 10 days from today. If that child is being exposed to that parent every day during those 10 days, their quarantine period always gets resetted. So you expose them tomorrow, their 14 days starts tomorrow, or 10 days. Um, they're exposed to the parent the next day, their 10 days starts the day after that, and so on and so forth, until the last day of those 10 days, and that's when the quarantine period actually starts. So every day of exposure during those 10 days resets the quarantine period. But what is difficult okay. is in the block schools, 10 days is 20 class periods. It's not 10 class periods. You understand what I mean? Yeah. It equates to 20 full classes they miss. Right. That it's work that they would have to catch up. They can't catch up from that. You, you can't catch up from 20 missed classes. Okay, so the last question I have for you is, 
if someone it, again is positive in my home what does it mean to be exposed that we have to show that i'm not in the same room with the person the person is not at you know expressing co you know so to speak what does that really mean exposure yeah, so exposure is characterized of, uh, by being in close contact with somebody less than six feet apart for more than 15 minutes within a 24 hours time frame. So if there is a possibility in which the person who is positive in the household isolates themselves in a room and do not come in contact with anybody else unless when there's nobody home or when everybody's asleep and then they're cleaning and disinfecting um, all of the areas, it is a very high probability that nobody else in that household is going to be positive. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, what are the symptoms of Omicron? They're the same symptoms as COVID-19. Uh, the only, um, so, um, Sore throat, cough, uh, shortness of breath, uh, weakness, um, some digestive system um, symptoms as well. The only difference was that in South Africa, they mentioned the fact that um, the loss of taste and smell was not as predominant. It was more of the weakness and feeling tired. Uh, but overall, the symptoms are the same as the, as the same virus that's causing the same disease. What age groups in Guilford County are not yet eligible to receive the vaccine? Um, zero to four. Um, to your knowledge, have we turned any children away from receiving the vaccine? No, uh, due not to, to lack my lack of vaccine or appointments no. or whatever. No. So if they get an appointment, they get the vaccine. Yes. And there are various other places where an appointment is not necessary. Walk-ins are welcomed. Okay. Um, in the past three weeks, have we had any clusters? Yes. In Guilford? Yes. In our schools? Yes. Okay. And my final question is for Dr. Contreras. If someone is in that situation where they're going to miss, <clears throat> could miss 10 days of class, do they have an online option? An online option. And to watch online? What, can they watch online? Can they take their classes online? No, no. Why? They can make up the work, but we don't have the capacity to, uh, for teachers to teach to the students in class and online as well. But we had that capacity. We were trying to do that. It was very difficult for well, students. Well, I know. The yeah. teacher said it was very difficult, but they did it for a year, online they, teaching. Yeah, the protocols that yeah. we set up, um, so we had the swivel devices, right, and teachers were trying to be followed and interact with each of the students in the classroom, and it was really difficult, and the quality of instruction for both the students in the classroom and the students who were at home suffered. Um, the only case that that has been something that we've entertained this year is if 50% or more of a class is quarantined and the rest is still sitting in the classroom. But um, isolated incidents, one or two students are receiving um, asynchronous, not live lessons through Canvas, and our um, teachers are expected to provide feedback and interact with those students. Teachers keep an updated course. Um, they, um, they update their Canvas shells weekly in the event of a quarantine so that the pacing stays the same, but they're not pulling double duty simultaneously like they were when you know, a year so ago. So the students may not be getting the full effect of teaching, but they're getting something. They're not getting direct instruction. They're getting content and they're getting feedback, but and it's not, not nearly They're getting the, the assignment right. without instruction. But then the teachers follow up with them? Is they that grade, what? they provide feedback, but they're, okay. they're still doing their regular job. 
I think we have to be clear. They're not getting instruction. The assignments are listed on Canvas. That's right. Yes. Okay. Just just asking. Are you guys needed? All right, Deborah. And real quick, Dr. Contreras, um, I know that we had already discussed um, bringing back field trips after January, somewhere in there. Was having volunteers going back to back into school part of that plan? I just can't remember. Or no? We're trying to take this one step at a time because if we do everything at once and then we start having lots of cases, we can't, we won't be able to figure out what caused it. So we want to try the thing we heard from the teachers about the most was the field trips. So we're going to start with that. Then we'll start bringing back volunteers. So we're going to go one step at a time. But we don't want to do everything at once because we want to make sure with each step that we're not uh, dramatically increasing cases. Thank you. A follow up to to that. Who who are we allowing in the schools right now? Uh, several people made reference to parent volunteers. Are we allowing that in the schools now? No. So who is just staff? Uh, we have staff. We do have some uh, coaching for teachers. Okay. We have some of our coaches. Um, I think there have been some special situations where we've had um, uh, parent, um, uh, what do we, our conferences. Parents had a choice of having parent conferences in person or online, but we were actually the parent conferences online worked more effectively at the secondary level when parents weren't running from classroom to classroom. Um, I see. Am I forgetting anyone? Um, there's a couple of things that are a part of the instructional program. Um, like we had um, a, um, an author who um, came and they projected reading from the library, but they weren't sitting right there with the kids. And then there were some instrument, like some um, professional musicians that were a built in where they came in and the kids still had access to it, but it wasn't like a like a volunteer coming in to sit next to a student and read or sit next to a student and eat lunch or something like that. Linda? A couple of things with lowering. I'm thinking microphone. You know, one of the things that was going on was Thanksgiving. Yes. And a lot of people were going to probably see their elderly family members. And before that, I would think they would do a COVID test. So maybe that spike, I don't know the time frame for that when it was a lot of testing going on. Um, but we just got through Thanksgiving and people were, you know, had plans for an extended period of time. Now when I when I go to that bottom number, okay, if you take sixty four cases and you divide that by eight hundred, you get Eight percent. If you divide that same number by sixteen hundred testing, you get four percent. So that bottom number, how much testing? Because you could have the same number of cases, but because you're doing less testing, that number can spike. So, you know, I'm I'm struggling with that, especially as more people are vaccinated. More people have had COVID. We haven't talked about, you know, the antibodies and that people believe once they've had it, they don't need to get tested. And so that number's a little, you know, moving. And especially as we continue down the road, I see less and less people going to get tested. You know, and we may get down to where 10 people are getting tested and there's one case and that makes it 10%, correct? So, you know, my question is, is where do we finally get to a point where we say we're at a point where we don't have to mask everybody, okay? Um, because it just f feels like a, 
an endless cycle here and people want to know you know where where do I where do we get out of the circle of it um, you know I don't really you know like the fact I mean it makes clear sense that your numbers of testing is going to go down people have had a lot of people have had COVID all right so they have antibodies right um, the more people you're at 64 percent plus we're not taking into account how many antibody how many people have had COVID and have already deemed that they're not going to get vaccinated because they don't need to get vaccinated or in their view they don't need to get vaccinated so you know we're at a fairly high percentage we're not looking at the people that have had it and i'm like kind of going you know these parents are sitting out there going where's it end where's it end um and i think parents are deserve to know at what point is it going in because you said we're at eight percent but you also not, you also clearly stated that we had a major drop in so actually it, it could be fewer cases than last week but because we didn't have people tested it it went up to eight percent am i wrong well the, okay so the denominator is the one that fluctuates so just like i've said the testing is the one that drives the positivity rate the positivity rate is not the only metric that we're looking at. We're looking at actually new cases. So I'm looking every day at how many new cases we're having. So the positivity rate is not what's driving our understanding of how many new cases are there because we know that that fluctuates based on testing. So the statement around um, today we may have less tests or less positive cases then the other, the other day, based on the number of tests that are being done or the positivity rate is not necessarily accurate because I'm not looking at positivity rate. I'm looking at actually number of new cases that have been identified every day. But that was the number that you gave us. You gave us the 8%, which is the positivity rate. That's it? correct. That and is you the... did not tell me that last week we had 100 cases and this week we had whatever it might be. All right, now I can kind of back into that number a little bit by doing 8% and back, you know, back into how many cases you probably had. So I'm just saying the numbers parents want to know, where are we coming out at? I mean, I know what you're saying that masks are not overly unhealthy, okay? But for some children, it is unhealthy. I mean, I went to the doctor with one of these little blue maskies Okay, now my, my, my oxygen rate is usually 100%, okay? Whenever I go to the doctor, I'm 100%, fairly fit. I put, put this little, he took it with this on, not intentionally, not intentionally, but I do have a hard time breathing through these things. And my oxygen rate, because it shocked me, was 77. Okay, because in these, in these doctor's offices, what did they want you to do? They want you to have this on. Right? And he didn't tell me to take this off, so I didn't. And I was extremely shocked <coughs> that, because I'm like, what do you mean 77? 77 is terrible, right? That's terrible. So, you know, I know what we're saying, but I also know these parents are saying, you know, teachers have got their hands full in those classrooms. And we can say that a teacher's going to replace that mask, but she's got 20 little bodies running around there. And that little body could have, you know, done anything with their hands. You know, can she truly be responsible for making sure that children that need clean masks get clean masks? I, personally, I don't believe that they can. So I'm also, you know, I'm just struggling with, you know, it just seems like a never ending cycle. If COVID is never going to go away and we get all these people vaccinated and we get all these children vaccinated, are we still wearing masks? I mean, cause we're saying, even if you're masked, you're supposed to wear, I mean, even if you're vaccinated and yes, I'm vaccinated. Okay. But at what point, does it end? So that's my question to all these professionals. 
at what point do we say, all right, you're vaccinated, you, everyone's had, we're, you know, if you take into consideration all the people that have had COVID, we're almost at 100%. Are we still wearing these? Are we still wearing these? So, you know, I'm just really struggling with the, I feel like a hamster in a circle, okay? And that is never going to end because there's always, it's always a moving target because we said, well, when we get 4%, all's going to be good, right? Well, we hit 4% and it's not good. Um, the number changes based on, and I can, con my view, you're going to continue to see the amount of testing going down because you want that. That's, that is what you want, right? So, you know, I'm struggling and these parents are struggling and they don't feel secure that their children that are wearing these masks are getting fresh masks when they need fresh masks. They don't believe that when their child sneezes in that mask that it's immediately being replaced with that teacher. So they have valid concerns. So, you know, DHSS needs to come up with where does the circle end? Where can they jump off at? Because um, I don't see it and I don't see it coming. So is this the in forever cycle that we're living in? Because I can also tell you I'm out in the world, okay? I go to the grocery store. I go all over the place. And there is a huge percentage of people not wearing masks, which then go home to their children. And, and that we're not exactly seeing a revolution like major, you know, explosion of COVID again. So parents want to know where they get off. And how, when are we going to be out of wearing these things? Because there again, I do not believe that children's masks are being probably not, not blaming teachers. They have got their hands full. I think all these teachers that were here, they're doing the very best they can. But that's also like when I was looking for uh, childcare for my, my little baby, I wanted a one to five ratio. And even that I thought was terrible because that means they're only getting fed, changed, and picked up occasionally when you got five babies. A teacher that has 20 to 25 children running around with these things, there is no way that they know that this child sneezed in it, that this child did something in it, that this child took it and smashed it somewhere and picked it up off the ground and put it right back on her face, okay? So, that's where I'm at, and I got it, but, you know, we got to find a way to get off the, the circle. Thank you. And Betty? Um, can I just add one, just one thing? Of course, sure. I wish I had a crystal ball to answer the question, but I want to um, emphasize the fact that we do not want the tests to go down. Just like we don't want the tests to go down in any other situations in which tests are being used to identify illness. We don't want colon cancer screenings to go down. We don't want flu tests to go down. We don't want HIV tests to go down. So this is the same thing with COVID-19 tests. We don't want the tests to go down because that means that we'll be able to identify more individuals. Thank you. Betty? Thank you, Dr. Van. Okay, it's another question for Dr. Contreras. It's my last question for tonight, I think. <laughs> Don't say that. Um, <laughs> okay, next. the question is, if students, our policy is for us to wear masks while we're inside the building. I have seen several people tonight without masks, even coming in to speak. So my question is, if students refuse to wear masks, what is the repercussion for that? It depends on their age and behavior. So, um, you know, if a principal or a teacher continues to ask them to 
do something and they refuse to do it, the code of conduct would, uh, uh, they would be in violation of the code of conduct for being insubordinate. Okay, I promise my last one. Okay, so that's for students. So what do we need to do as far as our policy? Do we need to change our policy, put something to our policy? Because we are not following our own policy. Yeah, it's kind of difficult if we don't follow policy and then we try to discipline students for not following policy. And everyone's watching us not follow policy. Diane, thank you, Betty. Um, I would, would like to move the item, but I do want to just say, you know, we got three days left in school. And these three days before uh, a break is challenging enough to keep everybody focused and just doing. I think it would be uh, unwise for us to change this policy tonight and have, uh, you know, the, I mean, the teachers are already frustrated with the number of things they got to keep up with. And I think that if we change this policy tonight, uh, with three days left, it's just going to wreak that much more frustration and, and havoc. And I don't think that's how we want folks to go out. Plus, if what Dr. Van is telling us, um, the last two weeks, we're beginning to see uh, an increase again in the infection rate. I, I think it will be, and, and we're going into uh, two weeks of these kids being out um, and at home and other places, shopping and doing all of those things. And so that means that their uh, likelihood of being exposed, their likelihood of not wearing masks, or that, though that's not not control, because when you're out there in the grocery store with your mama, if your mama don't want to wear a mask and she doesn't want you to wear a mask, that's on them, then, there. But in the environment that we can control, uh, I think it would be uh, in our best interest to leave this mask mandate in place and, and then revisit it because I, I would think by the first week, if we have our meeting the second week of January, we'll see over the next, of, over the two weeks the kids are out of school, whether we see continued increase in the infection rate. And I think that, and I don't know if you said this, the, the how do you say it, Omicron? The Omicron is supposedly more easily um, contra yeah, transmitted than these other two. So. There's going to be, and you did say that there's some cases in Guilford County now, right? No. No? In North Carolina. Okay. But, but it's only. Yes, it's, in North Carolina. It's only a matter of, of people coming from Charlotte to, to Greensboro that it's going to be here if it isn't already here. Maybe they just haven't seen it. Because as she said, if, if you haven't tested someone to, you know, you got to know what you're looking for, right? Okay. So uh, I'd like to, uh, I think we beat this horse about as dead as he can be, and, and he still got his mask on, too. So can we go ahead and move the item? I second it. I'd like to offer a motion, a substitute motion, that we give parents the choice in February of 2022 to mask or not mask. That's my motion. The law requires you to vote on this every month, so you can't project that far in the future. Okay. To give them the choice? Yes, so the law requires month. you it to... It doesn't stop us from voting every month. Well, in other words, it would have no effect because you're going to have to vote in February again. That's fine. There's, but I think... It won't have any effect because you'll have to reconsider it each time. That's fine. We only have January and, we, and then we have February. And if we prepare the community... I think... For, um, Councilor, what... Other boards have said starting such and such date, it will be optional. I think that's what she's asking. Well, I'm just saying February is more than a month away, and so you will have to vote again before you get there. You could say starting two weeks from now, but if you go beyond the every days. month period, you're mm -hmm. going to have to reconsider it by law. In January. Right. So you're not going to be able to. So see. she could say that in January, but she, she can't do it in December. Today's what? The, the 14th, you could say effective January 13th, but you'll have to reconsider it on the 14th. So it won't 
get very far. How long is the governor's mandate in place of, of us doing this, this is every not month? the governor. This is the legislature. Okay, the me. governor had nothing to do with this. How long is this going to be in place, though? Well, the legislature is not even in session, so odds are at least until they decide to go back to Raleigh I mean, at the earliest. I make a substitute motion that when we return to school from the winter break, that we make mask optional. But I think it has to be within the 30 days, just like Jill said, because we'll have to vote on it again. That's within 30 days. January meeting. January meeting. Okay. Well, Madam Chair. Yes. The, 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 you know, the, the thing about doing that, though, if we come back here in January and the infection rate has continued to climb, do we want to put ourselves, okay, so, so what, regardless of where the infection rate is? Excuse me. Um, we're getting messages that the live stream just stopped or something. For IT folks. This technology can look, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bellamy. Keep going. No, let's just hold on just a minute. Keep going. No, if we can just hold on just a minute because oh, okay. the public can't, can't hear us. January meeting. The 11th. I just got a message. The live stream's working. Okay. Your next meeting is the 11th of January. Kids return to school the 4th of January. So, do we have official word that our streaming is working? It is okay. Great. Thank you. Sorry for that disruption for anyone. We did cease our conversation collectively. Um, so, Diane, I think you were talking. Yeah, well, all I'm saying is, I mean, you've got several different attempts to, um, to do a substitute motion, but I think that if the positive, the positive rate is continuing to go up, you know, and we're going to be out of school for two weeks, it, what is the harm in us leaving the mask mandate in place until we come back on the 11th. And, you know, plus that gives people a chance because kids will then have been exposed to their families or whatever, or had the opportunity, hopefully, to get vaccinations during this period of time. I mean, there is no no rush to undo the, the, the mask mandate because the kids are going to be out of school uh, as of Friday. Is what, I don't think the motion got a second, did it? Ooh, my motion or mine. Sure. Yeah, okay. That when we return after winter break, we make the mask optional. I'll do a second. Kim has a question. I just have a question for Jill. How close to February can we can we proclaim? It says once a month, so you are on the 14th. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're on the 14th, so you could go to the 14th, <laughs> arguably. But you'll have to reconsider it. But since you have an, you have monthly meetings, your first meeting of the month would be the next time you would be together to consider it. So that's the 11th. I mean, you could call a special meeting later than the 11th on the 14th, but that seems extreme to me. But if if we pass this motion, when the kids come back after winter break, right, they would be optional until the 11th when, when we meet. vote again. Yes. And we could affirm 
or deny that doesn't the motion sense. at that point. So, so it would be optional for that week? Yeah. I think that would give us a little bit of a chance to see. It, people may not choose optional. It may be a rare case that a parent... I mean, I've, we've heard from a lot of people, but I don't think it would be mass, M-A-S-S, -S, unmasking. So your substitute motion is, is to... Um, <clears throat> make mask optional upon return from the winter break January the 4th and lend a second to that. Yep. Okay. So please vote using your devices. Dr. Funderburg, is it set up? All right, that fails by a vote of six to three. And so uh, I bring the motion to yes. For us to Thank you, Madam motion. Chair. Okay. I like to make a motion to <clears throat> hold on, Betty. We, Diane was going back to her motion. Okay. So your motion, Diane. It was going to be the, to go back to the original motion, but I'll yield to my colleague if that's what she wants. I will second, um, board member. <laughs> Can you say state Thank your you. motion, Diane? <laughs> To keep the mask mandate uh, know, that we currently have in place until our next meeting. January the 11th. A second. All right, please vote. After the board is clear. No, I'm not clear. Hmm? I'm still not clear. Um, no, nobody's clear. Oh, sorry. The and to the next that meeting. It's to the next meeting, which is January the 11th. So we're going to keep the, the motion is to keep the mask mandate in place until the next meeting, January the 11th. So that's a week. When we were yes. then voting on it. Okay. Do you mean until January 12th? Well, the meeting's on Well, the yeah, right. until you until reconsider it on the 11th. That doesn't affect children. That affects the conduct of the board. Okay. Right. So it's about a month. Because <clears throat> it's like five days after Anita's motion would have started. So in other words, we cannot say, have, project that we want to give the choice on January 17th because it's too far in advance because we have to vote again on the 11th. Correct. Got it. All right, and that passes by a vote of five to four. All right, so the mask mandate is in place until um, we vote again January the 11th. Thank you um, very much. We are now at the consideration of revised policy. I'll call on Policy Committee Chair Betty Jenkins to present the revised policies for the board's consideration. Yeah, you want to tell her you want to correct that? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to make a motion to adopt the following policies as presented. Policy 1320. 3560, which consists of the Title I Parent and Family Engagement, Policy 4040-7310, Staff Student Relations, Policy 4125, Homeless Students, and last but not least, Policy 7410, Teachers Contract. Thank you. Um, please vote using your devices. Yes. Is your mic on, Diane? Mm -hmm. I have a question on the policy 7410. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and ask? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it, it has to do with the line that talks about the suspension of, of teachers. I, I need a little bit more clarification. Um, I can't pull it, pull it up. It, it talks about define the teach, oh, okay. It talks about define a teacher's year of service as 120 work days to comply to the new state law and also provide an approved legally entitled leave um, do not count against the accumulation of 120 days um, for one year. Yeah, okay, it's, it's in the, let me see yeah. if I can pull it back up. All of it's these the, policies are 
simply changes to reflect the updates in legislation. Okay. Hang on. Give, give me a second. Ms. Bellamy Small, I think the language you're referring to is a suspension will not constitute approved or legally entitled leave for purposes of this policy. Is that the sentence? Uh -huh. okay. yeah, that comes right out of the statute. Okay. So it's, 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 it's legal that we do it that way. All right. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Please. Okay. Thank you. You know, since I don't, I don't There's actually quite a bit of case law that does not allow you to change any of if if they say this is what a legal year is that's what a legal year is and boards couldn't change that if they wanted to <laughs> well i am looking out for teachers <clears throat> all right please cast your votes that passes unanimously by a vote of nine to zero we are now at action item c madam chair may i ask a question yes, for the future mm -hmm. I have a problem voting <clears throat> on policies in mass. I oh, think I they should be voted on individually in the future. Okay. Um, when we get the agenda, um, <clears throat> board members have seven days to pull an item. I'm not. I'm not saying pull anything, but mm -hmm. each policy is unique in and of itself. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. You follow what I hear I'm you. saying? I do. It's like the consent agenda. Yeah. Yeah, uh, if they're not like the consent agenda because they're policy, but I think we should vote on them individually. It only takes. I was minute. saying like the consent agenda, like we vote on each of the items individually. Yes. I hear yeah. you. Okay. I'll follow mm -hmm. you. Right. It, it, it was um, the direction to the policy committee chair to vote on these when they come. And I understand, and I'm not trying to change tonight. I'm asking futures. Yeah, we all have some discussion about it. Okay. Because like I said, it's, um, um, and just a reminder um, that any of the agenda items are um, here or received in advance. So if you have questions, you know, so the superintendent and her staff can have time to prepare a response because um, I did not get any questions about any of the agenda items about this. So um, we're now at action item C and I'd like to ask um, Ms. Angie Henry, uh, to come and talk about the budget resolution. I just, um, before um, Ms. Henry speaks, I just want to thank the board for their patience. We certainly could have put this on the agenda at the January meeting, but um, Ms. Henry and all of the leadership staff worked uh, for two straight weekends and all week long to get this on this meeting agenda so that staff could have their state bonuses. So that's the only reason they put it on this agenda instead of next month and rush to do this. And it took so long uh, so that um, they could, staff could receive the state bonuses. So we thank you for your patience uh, as they work through trying to update all of the, uh, the additions from the state budget. So thank you, Ms. Henry, and to the entire leadership team for giving up uh, two straight weekends to work on this. Certainly, and um, thank you, Superintendent, for your leadership in this. I think it's important to note, and we'll talk about this as we go through, um, um, that this budget is the same as the budget that the board approved, um, or budget request that the board approved in May to send to the county commissioners. It's just been amended to reflect all the actions taken by the, the General Assembly when they passed the um, finally passed a, a state budget, first one in three years. So those are the biggest changes that you'll see as we go through uh, this budget information. So we'll start with the, the mission. Um, when we look at our 2021 budget, we, we've kept our priorities in place um, as we uh, came back to, to school full time uh, this year for a whole year. Um, our priorities have remained um, as we've talked about last spring. Um, what was included in the, the state budget um, we also have a little bit here with our local teacher supplement for teacher compensation. Um, and this is uh, what every teacher or every teacher or every employee paid on the teacher salary schedule will be impacted by these um, changes. So um, as you'll recall, we did increase 
the local teacher supplement. We were one of the few districts in the state that did that We're in an effort um, along with our county commissioners to bring our teacher supplement up to uh, trying to get it to the highest right. level in the state. So the $8 million that the um, commissioners provided for that, we have already put in place. This board approved um, us moving forward with increasing the supplement schedule. Um, in August. So we've gone from where our, our lowest supplement in 2021 was $3,990 or 399 a month is what our teachers saw to uh, our minimum this year um, is $610 a month or $6,100. So um, that's a significant difference um, that we've seen. And again, those are uh, dollars that are provided, funds that are um, from our local dollars for, uh, provided through our county um, appropriation. The state did pass, um, the state budget did include an allotment for a teacher supplement. They, it um, included $100 million for this, and it's an allotment for teacher supplement for all local education agencies except five. Those five are Buncombe, Durham, Guilford, Mecklenburg, and Wake. So our teachers are not going to receive these additional dollars that are provided um, to all the other teachers or most other teachers across the state. Um, here, in, in the, our teachers in Guilford County are not going to receive those dollars, which will make competing for teachers more difficult and it'll make it much harder for us to get to the top of the supplement, um, you know, schedule. Um, you know, we already had an uphill battle and now it's just gotten steeper. Um, teachers and most of our instructional support staff are gonna receive a step increase, which is about two and a quarter percent. But each, in, uh, each step has also been increased by 1.3%. So they'll be moving up a step and then each step has been increased. So teachers for the last two years have gotten their step increase. The steps have not been increased, but they have gotten that, you know, move from one step to the next. But this year they're getting a step increase along with um, an increase in the amount for each step. Our psychologists, um, SLPs, audiologists, and our OTs and PTs are going to receive $300 per month, a $350 per month um, additional supplement. And our counselors are going to receive a hundred dollars per month additional supplement and these are all 10 month employees so you can multiply that by 10 to annualize those amounts so those are the um that's their salary increases and those are the ones that are you know perpetual perpetual and recurring when we look at what um, the state has put in place for bonuses for our licensed staff and this is again teachers and all of our instructional support staff um, all teachers are going to receive a uh, $300 bonus, and those are uh, the ones that are employed by January 1st, 2022. And this is in lieu of um, some performance bonuses um, that are not gonna be paid or haven't been paid in the last uh, couple of years. All um, teachers who receive, teachers and instructional support staff who receive COVID training are gonna receive a $1,000 um, bonus. Um, if they receive COVID training before December 31st, 2021, and they're employed on January 1st, 2022. All public school employees are gonna receive a $1,000 bonus and an additional $500 to those sal with salaries less than $75,000. So that will include a substantial a number of our teachers um, will receive um, the, the 1,000 and the 500. And then there are performance bonuses for I AP, IB, AICE, as well as industry credentials of up to $3,500. And those are, those are uh, calculated on a per pupil basis, either $25 or $50 per student who meets um, the criteria. And again, it max, it's maxed out at $3,500. So those are um, the state, um, those are what the state did for teachers. It's important to note here that the district has to pick up the cost for our locally funded teachers for the $300 for all teachers, the $1,000 for the COVID training. Um, those two we have to pick up um, from the locally for our locally funded teachers. The state's picking up the cost for all of the, um, for the one for the all public schools employees, the thousand and the 500, as well as the performance bonuses. So that, uh, for that reason, you'll see a difference in our um, local fund budget. When we look at school administrator compensation, 
Um, assistant principals, their salary is calculated um, based on the A schedule teacher salary um, plus 19%. So they're gonna, their increase is gonna be similar to what the teachers see. Um, they won't have the supplements with it, but it will have the, the um, step increase and the increase um, amount for each step. The principal salary schedule is increasing by two and a half percent. There's not gonna be a change for growth. Um, if you recall, it, it feels like it's been forever, but um, principal salaries are, are scheduled to change um, in January based on prior year growth and then current year ADM. Um, this year, there will be um, no change for growth, no increase or decrease for growth. They will be updated in January for the current year um, ADM, but all the entire schedule has been increased by two and a half percent. Um, for uh, school administrator bonuses, all principals employed as of January um, 1st, 2022 are gonna get an $1,800 bonus. And this is in lieu of the performance bonuses that have been um, paid out in the past. And then they are also eligible for the $1,000 and then the $500 for any that make less than 75,000 a year um, as all state employees are. For our uh, classified staff, our non-certified staff, they're gonna get the higher of two and a half percent or $13 an hour. So all of our staff will be making a minimum of $13 an hour this year. Um, that includes substitute teachers um, or any substitute. And again, all, all employees are gonna be required to be paid at, at a minimum of $13 an hour this year. Next year, that's gonna go up to $15 an hour. Central office staff will get a two and a half percent increase. Um, classified staff bonuses, our classified staff are also eligible for the $1,000 and then the 500 if they have a salary of less than $75,000. And again, these are all funded um, by the state. Our benefit rates went up higher than we expected them to. Our retirement rate is now at 22.89%. It went from 21.68% up. Um, that means with just FICA and retirement, the benefit costs are at least 30%, and then you add $7,000 for health insurance. Um, so the benefit cost to um, employee, as you know, employee, uh, an employee <laughs> has gone up uh, significantly. Um, it's you know at least you know 35%. I would say for most of our our staff. Um, for our sustaining operations, we did um, have we do have an increase in our charter school enrollment that uh, we did expect, and, and we had that in the original budget that you passed or the budget request that you sent to the commissioners in May, and the one-time reductions from the uh, 2021 budget. Again, those are the exact same thing that we had in uh, the budget that you uh, sent to the commissioners in May. So, in summary, our um, total operating budget is uh, a little over a billion dollars. I think this is the first time we've reached this level, but that's because the ESSER funds are included in our federal grants fund. So you'll see um, uh, our state makes up 42.1% of the budget this year, locals 22.3%, and then federal is 35.6%. These are certainly not numbers that we're used to seeing. They, are, they look very different than budgets, um, previous budgets. When we look at how these dollars are budgeted, we're at 67.7% are in salary and benefits, 13.7% is in purchase services, 9.4% in supplies and materials, you'll see 6.7% in equipment, and then the 2.5% transfer for charter schools. So when we look at our total budget, um, the budget resolution totals $1,104,027,405. You can see um, each fund, um, individually here and how it compares to last year's budget resolution. Um, you have some other information in, in the um, documents that were shared with you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Kim. Uh, yes, thank you, Andy. Um, when you talk about the schedule, when does the schedule begin? When do people begin to see their, their funds? So um, that'll depend on what action the board 
does or doesn't take tonight. If, if we, if the board will um, pass a budget tonight, we should be able to, salary increases are supposed to be in, in, implemented in January. Um, bonuses, the $1,000 um, bonus that all public employees are getting paid. Um, those are for staff who were employed as of December 1st. So they have to be paid by January 31st, but they can be paid any time between now and January 31st. Um, the same thing for that 500 for those that are making less than 75,000. All the other bonuses have to be paid in January. Retro this year, and that's, I mean, this is, this is what's made a lot of this very complicated. Um, retro pay is gonna be paid very differently this year than it has in the past. Uh, it's gonna be calculated and paid as a bonus. That does not have to be paid by January 31st and likely will not be paid by January 31st because our software vendors are having to, to work on coming up with um, how it's gonna be calculated in our system. So um, most of these things uh, will be paid in, in January um, if the board approves the budget um, this evening and we're able to, to start January 1, um, the first payroll in January. And then also when people receive a bonus, is that tax at a higher tax rate considered a gift tax or how, how does that impact them? Right. And is this one lump sum or is it separate from their salaries and things like that? So when we pay bonuses, we typically do each bonus in a separate run. Um, which means it's a, we run a separate payroll for each bonus, so it's not taxed along with all the other income that okay. month. We do have, the, but we do set that there are standard rates you use, and I, I, I believe it's twenty five percent and six percent, but I I, I don't remember, recall okay. right off the <coughs> top of my head. So you know, for some people that may be more tax than they're normally paying. For some people, it may be less. It's just dependent on how you have have your you know withholding set up. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, we know it's going to be 7.65% for FICA and then um, whatever, you know, the 25 that we use for federal and then the, I think it's 6% that we use for state um, for the taxes. So, but oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So then I get my separate check on the 30th and then I'll get a separate check for the bonus. It'll be, a, it'll look like a separate payment. Yes. Right, a separate payment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it may be multiple bonuses. Right. Or it, it may depend on how, what time of the month we pay. We may not pay them all on the 30th. It, we may try to do some early and some on the 30th. Okay, so my final question, and normally with the, the supplements, uh, help me just to clarify what does that look like when a teacher supplement? Is that part of their paycheck? Yes. Is that's, it a separate yeah. line item? So different districts do it um, Different districts may do it different. Well, different districts do pay their supplements different. Um, smaller districts typically pay them twice a year, um, maybe in November and then maybe again in May. Larger districts typically divide their supplement over the 10 months that the, the um, whoever's receiving the supplement are employed. And so we pay it over the 10 months and that's how we do ours. It's paid over 10 months. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and our teachers received that in August because of the action this board took in August and allowed us to go ahead and start paying those increases. Thank you, Diane. And then Anita. Maybe, maybe you explain this, but on page five, why were we excluded? Did you explain that? You said that there were five counties that were excluded from... I, I don't know. I think that we they've said it was for counties with... Um, Tax, a tax base or a population of more than 90,000. I, I don't know exactly the reason that, that they excluded these five counties. Okay. Uh, you do? <laughs> I sent the formula to the board oh, that uh, Mr. Hardister, Representative Hardister sent to me. Okay. Well, you should get him to change that. Um, my next question, it has to do with um, what, what about um, where, where does executive staff, you know, like you and Dr. Mars, okay, and the SSOs, where do y'all fall? So where it would be in the central office category. So, so you get the 2.5, uh-huh. Y'all don't get bonuses? We would be included in the all, the all public employees bonus. Okay. Um, how significant was uh, getting the state legislative budget passed to us? 
I think it was, I mean, uh, unfortunately it was very late and which created problems for us, but it was, I mean, the fact that they passed one and they hadn't done it in the two years previous, I think that was very significant. So the, so we, we see increases in our budget based on them passing the budget. Yeah, if we look at the, the impact on the local fund budget, which um, it's the, if you look at the sheet with the yellow um, on it, you can see the impact that this state budget had on our budget. Uh -huh. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the increased expenditures. We've got four million dollar increase in um, charter school expenditures. Am because I looking of, at this? No, I'm sorry, it's the one with the yellow on it. Oh, I, I don't think I can pull it up. It's not on that computer. Sorry. Okay, just I don't know which one it is. So just tell me. It's one that says local current expense fund budget. Thank you. Okay, so so I mean, I guess it's important for for I think the public to understand how important it is and the impact of our state legislature doing their part to help us to pay the bills. Right, but the timing of it is really going to is what's created problems. So if we go back to this sheet, you'll see that you know we've got four billion dollar increase in charter school expenditures. The re increase in the retirement rate is going to have an impact on our local budget of a little over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. The impact of the hospitalization rate increase is 887,000. Um, local teachers, the impact of the salary increase um, is 1.2 million. You can see the uh, impact on uh, for assistant principals is 64,000. The non-certified increase in central office increase for locally funded staff. Um, is 977,000. And then the bonuses for our locally um, funded teachers and inst instructional support that are participating in COVID training is about $900,000. That coupled with the things that are already, um, that were already at this board approved as part of the budget recommendation request to the county um, brings our total increase in expenditures to a little over $20 million. The county did fund us an additional $16 million this year but because we're in December and we've got $4 million more dollars that we've in expense than we got in funding, um, you know, we can't cut positions at this point. We can't cut dollars that we've already provided to schools at this point. We, there, there's nothing that we can do other than, um, you know, move some local expenditures to, to ESSER. And so that's what we're, we're recommending to balance the rest of this budget is to move $4.1 million dollars and eligible expenditures to ESSER funds for the remainder of this year, knowing that next year we're going to have to ask for these dollars um, off the top as we prepare the 22-23 budget. From the county commissioners. From the county commissioners, right. right. Mm -hmm. All right, and my last uh, question has to do with uh, the gentleman. He's been here before uh, as far as maintenance. I mean, I know some people don't value physical labor, but you cannot, I mean, we do not have, do not have a robot that I know of yet that can dig a ditch or do some of the, 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 the thing. Are we fairly compensating our maintenance and mechanics and those folks that we don't see? But they are certainly a, a, a very strategic part. I mean, when something breaks at a school, I, I don't see any of us or any of you running out there to, to fix it. Are we fairly compensating these folks or do we need to have some other kind of advocacy for those, I guess we would call them almost invisible and essential uh, people. So I, th I think we are probably, we are not competitive in our salaries with most of our maintenance and, and those kind of positions. Um, what the superintendent did in the ESSER budget, which I think has been very much appreciated, is bring those people up to $15 an hour for this year. And then next year, the state budget will do that, bring those all of our staff up to $15 an hour. So that's um, that's probably, in, for most positions, for some positions that may be a competitive salary, but for most, um, like our HVAC positions and some of our other positions, that's not a competitive salary. So, um, yeah, we certainly need to do more. Um, 
across the board for all of our staff for for our salaries. Okay, but okay, and, and I'm not trying to push this. For, you know, I am trying to push it too, because we we hear the voices of the bus drivers. We've even heard the voices of the uh, nutrition staff, uh, the TAs, uh, a uh, ACEs, but the voices of these, I mean, except for that gentleman, and he has written and he has come up here. And I think that it's important for us to understand that, you know, when, when, when nobody else wants to go out there in the cold, in the rain, I mean, I, I've seen those guys, uh, you know, digging hole posts to put signs up and stuff like that. You know, um, and plus the, their their rate of of even getting injured is possibly greater than uh, you know. Even though yes, we do have injuries in our public schools, but do, do you understand where I'm going with this? I, 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 and I don't know whose problem that is to try to fix that. Right. But, but I just want to put it out there that we need yeah, to pay since, these folk. Yeah. But since we can't generate resources, I mean, there's no way for the school board to generate resources. We have to rely on our funding bodies. Um, and quite frankly, I feel like that sits at the state level um, because the state should fund the operations of the school districts. Okay. okay, so so I guess there is not an answer for my question. About, that, that, I mean, we don't have any means to fund anything at this point. We don't have, unless the board wants to direct us to cut something, there aren't dollars, dollars available anywhere else to to increase those salaries. Okay, well, let me ask this one last question. Dr. Contreras, in in the the monies for the bonds for the new school <coughs> or for school construction, that kind of stuff, is there a possibility for there to be uh, fair compensation for our folk who has, have to maintain those schools and do, you know, because if you build a new school, then that means that it's, it's, it's hopefully 21st century, which means that then our maintenance staff have to be retrained because how they did things in the last century is not the same way, perhaps, as how they're going to take care of these schools in the 21st century. Is it, I mean, I'm just putting it on the table. Maybe this is not the place or the time. Maybe it should be in a budget conversation. But I, I just think that, that someone needs to say something for those folks who are really the backbones of trying to keep our schools uh, operational. Yes, yeah, so you may recall that the board approved actual, um, not just PD, but actual coursework for all classified staff that wanted to participate in coursework. Uh, um, unfortunately, very few, I don't know if any have, uh, have signed up so far. Dr. Morrison, have any signed up? We've not had a single classified staff member sign up thus far. Uh, but the board has made that available uh, to our classified staff. Have we explained the value of the connection of pay and, and being trained? I mean, have, have we done that? Pay them to be trained? No, no, no. Um, sometimes you have to help, help people understand the relationship between the value of training to increase pay. Yeah, you know, in our meeting with GCAE, we had a discussion about that, about, um, you know, if we are paying your tuition and helping you get an entire degree, that's the difference between a $4,000 bonus and making $2,000 more a month uh, in perpetuity uh, that can help change your life trajectory. So we've been trying to help our classified staff understand we want to change your life trajectory by helping you get bachelor degrees. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Okay, on page, oh no, uh, Diane's already asked that one. Um, what's the justification for the 25% federal tax rate? Some of these folks, that's pretty high because they're going to fall in a much lower bracket. Uh, because because we're paying it separate from their payroll, you either have to, I mean, if you pay it, if you want to use their tax rate, you have to pay it with their payroll and take into all their earnings for the month, which would make your earnings for the month appear to be much higher 
and put, may bump you up to a much higher tax bracket. Okay, I don't understand. When you do a separate pay run for the bonuses, you go in and change their federal withholding rate? No, we can do it. It's, it's an across the board. So I've got, a, I've got an employee set up in payroll, and that employee on a weekly or monthly, whichever, paycheck is at a 12% um, tax rate. And then they get a bonus on a tax to twenty five percent, right? But their tax rate's not but twelve percent. It's it's a withholding amount. It's right, and, right, and, right. But the twenty five percent's a withholding amount also, right? But if you're withholding single zero exemptions, whatever right. that rate seems right. to be, the, the withholding amount on that, if you're making two thousand dollars a month, it may be twelve percent. If that gets bumped up because we're giving you, you know, four thousand dollars worth of bonuses this month, that's going to look like you're earning six thousand dollars this month, and it's going to bump you up to a higher rate. That's not. I understand that, but right. you do it as separate payroll. But if you use the tax rate, we have to combine your whole earnings for that pay period. Why? That's the way the IRS says we have to do it. I'll go back. I can go back and check, but that's what. Okay. That's how we've been trained that we have okay. to do. Um, this gets a little confusing. Uh, on page eight, you've got school administrator bonuses. That's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. Then you go over to page 10, and you got the classified. Then you've got one that's all employees. So do they get both? So the classified is all public. Everybody gets... Everybody gets the thousand dollars, and if they make less than seventy-five thousand, they get the five hundred. Okay. So that's why it's on every slide. Every single category of employee gets that. Okay. So it's not every single employee gets that, and certified gets that. It's not doubled. Right. Okay. Certified gets what's on slide. It's not doubled. Was the question right? Um, on page. Nine. Yeah. What's the current? What do we pay subs per day, right now? Teacher subs. Um, certified rate is one thirty-five. The uh, the non-certified rate is one fifteen. And I think it's the highest rate in the state right now. It's a now. good rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think districts are because of the are starting to move up because of the $13 an hour they're so having So is it theirs. 135 if you have a certificate and 115 if you don't? Yes. Is it 135 if you have a certificate that has expired? Yes. What if the person doesn't care about getting it renewed? Did they just drop to the Dr. Morrison, you have to come to the microphone or the cameras can't pick up. <laughs> Okay, let's let's say this. Um, person went to school, got a certificate, never taught. And then they decide they want to come back 10 years later. Their certificate expired after five years, I think. They want to come back 10 years later and sub, but they don't care about getting their certificate renewed. Are they going to make 135 or 115? Well, not being licensed. Um so 115. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, page 12. Um, I know you talked about the dollars for charter school, but what was the number? It's based on the number of students, is it not? It is. What was the increase in enrollment? Um, the, in the actual increase in enrollment that we've seen, it's not the 862 that's on there. Yeah. <laughs> I have I want to say it's about 600, it's a little over 600. Increase in enrollment. Mm -hmm. And that equated to how many million? Well, it's 4 billion is the total increase in the charter school expense, but that's not but just because. Other, yeah. Right. It's okay. not just because that there's an increase in $600. It's, there are lots of reasons for that. I think that's all I've got for now. Uh, thank you, Deborah and then Pat. 
First up, Angie, thank you. I know that this has been a ridiculous amount of work, and I know I dropped the bomb in your lap, and I genuinely appreciate appreciate everything that you have put into this. <laughs> Seriously, thank you. Sure. Um, I do want you to clarify a couple things for me, especially for the people listening. Um, if we could go, uh, if we, everybody would look at page six. So we've got $300 in a bonus for all teachers employed on the 1st of 2022 that the state has said must be given, correct? Uh -huh. But the state has also said that it mu the money must come from the districts, right? If they're for locally funded staff, yes. Okay, so the state has said you must give this money. However, the state is not funding that money. They're, they're funding it for the state teachers funded they teachers. Fund. They're they're just funding it for our okay, right. So we're so we're going to bear a decent uh, share of the burden for that mandated uh -huh. bonus. And it seems like the same thing for the thousand dollars for the COVID training, correct? Correct. They're only going to cover a certain amount of our employees, and then we must cover the rest. So we're on the hook for quite a bit of money right there. Um, as an aside, uh, Dr. Contreras, I did have a couple different teachers ask me how they know if they've done the right COVID training. So all of our, there is essentially no teacher that has not participated in COVID training as we conducted four. And then we had principals conduct the training again this week for everyone just in case we sent another training module out and had them retrain the teachers to cover everybody one more time okay so everybody will be covered it's okay so we've done our best to ensure that everybody's going to get that thousand yeah. dollars thank you <laughs> thank you thank you um two to do two two i'm sorry there's a lot of pages and i flipped back and forth quite a bit here. Um, do, do, let's see. And we also have things in different areas. So on page 10, where it says, all public schools employees receive $1,000 and an additional 500 to those with salaries less than 7,500. This is not the COVID training thousand, correct? This is a separate thousand. That's the thousand that every employee will receive. Will receive from the state. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that the additional 500, that also comes from the state. Yes. Trying to figure out what exactly we're on the hook for locally because right. right. we're trying not to, or not to drown in this. And then the teachers get the step pay. And we have, oops, sorry. Do we have any kind of ballpark numbers, what that's going to look like, the increase in the retirement rate and the health rate? For our locally funded? Yes. Yes. It, it, the increase in the retirement rate is 86000 The increase in the hospitalization rate, did I say that right? Yeah, is 887000 Okay. And we also bear that burden of cost, correct? For our locally funded staff, yes. Okay, thank you. I think that was it. If I come up with something else, I'll come back in. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Pat and then Anita. Thank you, Angie. Um, I'll just kind of dovetail riff off of Deborah, I, I think. So I'm just doing some basic math. It looks like, and, and just correct me if I'm wrong, um, 1500 and that's essentially employees less than 75000 mm -hmm. Then there's three hundred dollars that the teachers would stand to get so that's eighteen hundred and then if they also and can what is the covid training for a thousand what do we it can be uh, it can be that? anything related to covid um you know safety cleaning um disinfecting it can be learning training on learning loss it can be uh, training on um, online um, instruction anything that was related to COVID, it can go back to March of 2020 mm -hmm. um, through December 31st, 2021. Um, so there are lots of different things related to COVID that, that could be included in that training. And every teacher has that opportunity to, to take that or is it limited to um, so many per As the superintendent just said, I, most of our teachers we feel like have already, we were given more than four opportunities to take it. And then we're, we've, we've, um, are doing refresher courses to be sure that everybody has an opportunity to take it before December 31st. Right. So in effect, if we just do that math, that's $22,800 that 
teachers. every teacher yeah should be yeah. able to, yeah. to receive the teachers and instructional support i mean right and those are our counselors and our social workers and our yes psychologists and everybody and then do you do we have a, a dollar amount on the step increase i mean i know that i mean just a rough number i think for myself maybe the public too would be interested in yeah there's, knowing. there's prob i mean the average is they're saying five percent let me look and see if i can tell what a dollar amount might be No, it's 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 hard. It's, it, I'm going to say it's probably in a lot of cases it's around fifteen hundred dollars, maybe. Um, yeah. Well, let's say it's a thousand dollars just for yeah. conservative. Mm -hmm. So that's um, that's thirty eight hundred dollars <coughs> if we just take all that money right there. Yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, I I, I often struggle. You know, what is fair? What, you know, when you talk about teachers, EMT, military, police, what, I, I don't have a good answer for that. I really don't. I mean, I, what is the number? I mean, where should we, what are we, you know, trying to get to? Is there a magic number that we all can be really feel good about? I mean, I'm, I think it's very noble and, and it's a worthy endeavor to, pay people bonuses um i'm more interested in growth in, in in struggling schools um i heard a business professor one time say that whatever you pay a bad employee is too much and you can never pay a good employee an excellent employee enough so i, I just it's really and, and that's not for us to decide tonight or certainly don't need an answer i just throw that out as you know i um, I, I certainly um, can support um, pay increases. I think it's, and if we look, I mean, I know we're talking a lot about the, the root causes of this and state legislatures, and uh, I can tell you this, if you look back in recent history, in 2008 and nine, we were around 43rd in teacher pay, somewhere around there, 41st, 43rd. Our state was woefully ill-prepared for the crash. I mean, terrible financial mismanagement happened in, in Raleigh. Um, we dug out of that after about two years. In about 2011, teacher pay started increasing, and it's, and it's continued to do so. Is it at the level that we're all happy with? I don't know, but um, I think now estimates are anywhere from – North Carolina's ranking is in the in the mid to late to latter twenties in teacher pay, and you know we can some it's thirty first and some we're twenty seventh. But I, I just and I know we need there's always a need for more. I just I struggle with what's fair. Um, obviously, a living wage I think we all all get behind, and we've we've made those you know that clear. Um, Again, it doesn't deserve an answer. I just so the thirty eight hundred dollars, Angie, um, because that's from the state. Um, if they're state fund, if they, I mean, all of it's from the state. If they're a state funded teacher, right? Mm. Um, what sort of is is there a burden or a financial uh, cost to us that that we're gonna that's going to be impacted here? I'm sorry, I don't. I don't well, I mean, sure I understand it, your question. It, I mean <laughs> that. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the yeah the the local cost for our um, for providing all of the the for our locally funded teachers to match what our state funded teachers are getting, um, one point two. It's a little. It's like two point one million dollars. About two point two million dollars. That we'll need to mm -hmm. find. And yeah. that, is that part of that four million? It is. Mm -hmm. Shortage. It is. Okay. That, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Anita? I'm, I'm trying to get where Pat has gotten and 
the dollars, how much. So I'm a teacher. I'm going to get 300. I'm going to get a thousand because I did the COVID training, and I'm going to get a thousand because I'm a public school employee. Uh, if I only make 45,000 a year, I'm going to get another 500. 75,000 a year. If you make less than 75,000. I know. Oh, okay. Yes. I make 45,000 a, a year, that makes so I'm going to get okay. another 500. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get 2,800. Where's the other thousand? Is that the raise? Yeah, if, if you average the increases in, in the steps, and this is not going to be the average raise because I'm not you know, calculating it by mm -hmm. the number of teachers in the district, the average increase is about $1,100 if you just average the increase for okay, each Okay, so I'm going to get $2,800 in bonuses and about $1,000 pay increase. Some steps are higher than others, but you're not including yeah. AP and CTE. Yeah, I'm teachers. not counting that. No. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say I'm a $25,000 a year custodian. I'm going to get 2500 bonus. Is that right? No, you're going to get a $1,500 bonus. All employees get 1000 for COVID. No, 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 only teachers and instructional only support. Only teachers. And instructional support get the 1000 for COVID. So did our custodians not have COVID training? Yes, they, they did. They did, but the state doesn't give them the bonus. It said all employed. That's under the teacher teachers bonus. It's under the teachers, only under teachers. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Diane? Madam Chair, um, I'd like to uh, make a motion to uh, accept the recommendation, but you're going to have to state what you re recommended again uh, uh, for for the budget for the 20. These are adjustments to the 20. Uh, this, I'm just uh, requesting that the board approve the 21 22 budget resolution that's included in your materials um, for a total budget of $1,104,027,405. What well, she said. Second. All right. Please vote. As soon as we get our devices set up. Thank you, Dr. Funderburg. It does. Mm -hmm. Passes by a vote of seven to two. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Henry. And we are now at a uh, discussion of staff bonuses. Thank you. Uh, this evening we present for your review uh, the recommendation for bonuses for staff. You may recall at the last meeting that Mrs. Knapper made a recommendation to provide bonuses for teaching staff. Uh, I have provided the uh, recommendation for that, but I uh, said at that meeting that I felt that all staff should receive a bonus so you see uh, recommend both recommendations, one in compliance with the, um, the board uh, request, which is just for teachers, which is $1,500 per employee. And then my recommendation, well, I'm sorry, which is $1,500 per teacher and then my recommendation, which is $1,500 for all employees, um, with the exception of principals and ass assistant principals who already received an ESSER bonus. Um, I also recommend that all classified employees <laughs> would receive an additional $500 for a total bonus of $2,000. Um, 
those would be the school nutrition workers, custodial workers, bus drivers, safety assistants, maintenance workers, and office support staff. And that would be a total of 9,462 employees for approximately uh, 15 million seven hundred sixty three thousand dollars out of the escher fund diane and linda sorry diane and linda okay so so what you are recommending is in addition to what the state is doing yes okay so um, if you don't mind i guess uh, so what would that total? What, what, it, okay, if a te I thought I heard someone say a teacher would be getting like two thousand eight hundred from the state. Is that correct? Two thousand eight hundred, I believe. Okay, and so then you're gonna add another fifteen hundred to that. Correct. Okay, so that's gonna be four thousand. Huh? Thank you. Forty three. 4,300, is that what you said? Okay, right. so that gets them to what they asked for? Well, they asked for 4,000 4, out of the ESSER fund specifically. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda? Okay, I need to get my Can phone. you turn your mic on? Uh, sorry. That's okay. A lot of numbers, a lot of craziness, okay. <laughs> Teachers, I mean, you know, the bonus here, I mean, it's basically 1500 for everybody, right? Yes. All right. But when we take the 30% off, it's going to, they're going to net a thousand. When you, what, what when you it? take off the 25%, uh, Shirley's rate. shaking her head. Shirley likes my math. Okay. Tax rate. All right. Yeah. Tax rate and then FICA. All right. So what they'll net is a thousand. Now, teachers that are at, let's go back to the other state bonuses. <clears throat> so we got 1,000 net, because you know what? You can say it's 1,500, but what they want to see is what they get in their hand. First, when you do your taxes, it might change, right? Well, the get there. right, and I understand that. I understand that, but you know, 1,500 sounds, you know, a little better than 1,000 when you net it. Okay, and then when we go back to the federal, what are teachers getting that are 16 to 24 years? Is there a difference or are we all getting the same thing? Because our older, the, the longer the teachers, that the, seems like the teachers that have the most years get less payment. And bonuses, Mrs. Walbert? Well, I'm, I'm asking. The bonuses are the same. All right. I'm uh, just making sure mm -hmm. there's no difference. So they, the, all teachers are on the state level are getting what? Bonus. Right. You're talking about just bonuses. Just bonuses. So all teachers, regardless of funding source, <coughs> are getting are eligible to get twenty eight hundred dollars, and that includes if they're that, a full time If they teachers. do that thousand dollar COVID testing training right. training training not testing. <laughs> like I said, I'm, it's getting a little late, and I'm getting a little tired. Okay, so which equates to, I mean, I don't think they care what, where they get the money. I think it's a matter of them getting some money. So now we've got 300, right, 15, that's what I'm trying to get to. So it's 4,300. Yes, teachers, 4,300, if I'm not mistaken, all of the staff come out around 35. And, and when will they see this money? Again, um, it'll be it'll it'll vary. The the state bonuses, except for the retro bonus, have to be paid by January thirty first, twenty twenty two. If we pay a bonus out of ESSER, we have to um, submit a change to our plan and a budget transfer request to the state and get that approved and get it back before we can pay the bonuses. Before we're authorized to pay the bonuses, the the fifteen hundred dollars that's in this. Um, memo um, before we can pay that. So we don't have a date yet on, on when that would be, um, when we'd have all that process complete to be able to pay that. The retro bonus we can pay um, when we get those calculations completed. Okay. 
Okay, so they can't, they will see a bonus in January is the game plan. Correct? That there there will be at not least all, not two, the, two the, and if they do the COVID training, there will be three bonuses in January. But not that ESSER bonus because that right. has to go to the state for approval. Right. All right. Now, since we've publicized this COVID training out on this, in this meeting, like, crazy well it's been i mean it's been popular. I know, okay. but, that, but now that they you know they really can add it up what is the the how, what's the opportunity now let's let's say we get everybody going hey i want thousand dollars and i want to get trained okay let me say this again they've all been trained four times well, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm i mean the money one the money training they, that is they've been so trained. they've all been trained so they can go ahead and get the, it yeah there was no specific yes. training it had to be covid related well, training well in all this conversation it sounded like they had to do another training no i was saying that we offered it one more time just in case someone missed it okay well see that totally confused me i'm like okay all right now see i needed to be clear because I'm thinking the way it was being said that there was an additional training that they had to do to get the thousand and but so everyone's going to get that thousand pretty much unless they somehow miraculously miss the memo. Just, right. Just teachers and instructional. Well, support. teachers. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I got it now. Um, I'm happier. But yeah, I'm always like, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Motion to move the item. Second. All right. As soon as we're able to cast your vote. Uh, what are you casting the vote for? My recommendation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Are ACES employees included in this too? Are ACES employees? Yes. Included? Yes. 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 They're there. It, they're part of the all employees yes okay and and just for one point of clarification if, if if i hear the math right you said teachers with the combination would get 4300 right in bonuses yes yes that does not include and the salary increase other classified employees would get potentially so three thousand is potentially i mean the lowest amount I think somebody would get in this opportunity if they're a full-time employee, so we're not prorating the bonus, would be $2,500 because if there's somebody who makes $76,000, they're only going to get the $1,000 bonus from the state and then $1,500, so it would be $2,500. All right, and then my last question is, okay, did Dr. Confers, did you tell us where you were pulling these funds from? Because I thought part of your concern at the last meeting was that you were going to have to pull this from something right else in order to do this. It's right. So one thing we were able to do is because the state next year is moving to the $15 an hour, remember we had put $15 an hour into the ESSER budget. So we were able to cut, I think, $10 million there. We did have to cut some other things uh, in the budget. And we had to add four million to cover other expenses, but because we uh, we cut the the counselors, the nurses, mobile buses, positions out, yeah, uh, the mobile buses, the tutoring buses, mm -hmm. out uh, to cover these bonuses. Okay, I want to be very clear here now. So you eliminated counselors okay which speaks to mental health and other okay. kinds of things you eliminated what was the other thing then nurses counselors nurses. and mobile tutoring buses and, and furniture and, and the fifteen dollars an hour and the fifteen dollars an hour starting next year because the state will pick that up now okay I, I just want people to be clear that that you know th doing this is going to cost us something else that would be significant to the well-being of the children am i correct yes okay thank you can't we yeah we we're voting and, and then we'll have a vote then you can yes yeah. you voted mm -hmm. All right, that passes by a vote of eight to one. 
All right. Um, where am I? Um, at reports from the chair, and I have a few comments. I know it's late, so I'm going to be brief if I can find them. Um, good evening and welcome. We're pleased to report that the Guilford County Commissioners approved our request to add one point seven uh, a one point seven billion dollar bond referendum to uh, okay to the upcoming primary election, which will now be held on May twenty May seventeenth, twenty twenty two. This is a tremendous opportunity for our district and one that will allow us to make safety and technology improvements at each of the district's 126 schools. Look for more information in the coming months. Congratulations to Superintendent Dr. Sharon Contreras, who received the 2021 Renaissance Award from the Welfare Reform Liaison Project, also known as WRLP. This award recognizes the superintendent's tireless effort and dedication to equip our youth with the knowledge and tools for college entry and beyond. The Career and Technical Education Department recently hosted a Builders Vibe Community Night Out to highlight the students involved in the Fannie Mae Safer Together Green Housing Project. Through this project, students in the Carpentry Pathway engage, innovate, and rebuild affordable single-family homes while gaining technical skills, credentials, professional mentors, and more. These students receive their yellow vest, safety glasses, and hard hats at the event's vesting ceremony. Coming up on December 16th, the CTE department will host a symposium to showcase the work of students in our five signature career academies and how they are bridging the gap from education to industry. Parents of bus riders, please make note, GCS will launch its transportation call center in January, making it easier for parents to receive assistance with their transportation questions. The call center can be reached by dialing 888-511 for GCS, 888 for GCS, and will be open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. Guilford County Schools will once again offer a holiday reading challenge, challenge. Pre-K through eighth grade students who read at least 300 minutes during the winter break will have the opportunity to earn a ticket to UNCG men's basketball game. So students can record the minutes they read over the break and turn in a reading log to their school library media coordinator by January 7th. We hope all students enjoy the winter break and uh, keep reading. This concludes my remarks. And I was laughing because I was thinking pre-K, they're going to get tickets to a men's basketball game. But okay. So anyway, uh, a treat's a treat, right? All right. Is there a motion to go into closed session? Are we going to need to come out and take a vote or any action? Huh? Okay. All right. So we won't. Uh, we could do board comments, so we can just come out and vote and leave. You want to do that? No. Don't we have super? You don't. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Yeah. Contreras. Forgive me. It's late, Dr. Okay. Contreras. We're now at the superintendent's report. Okay. Which is Thank more you. important than mine. Good evening. We are very proud of our GCS Teacher of the Year, English teacher Leah Corper of Northern High who was recently honored at the Piedmont Tri as the Piedmont Triad Region Teacher of the Year. This makes her one of nine finalists for the state title, and we wish her the best in representing Guilford County Schools through this process. Congratulations also goes to Dudley High School football team, which won the 3A state football championship title on Friday. These players have worked hard on and off the field, especially after playing two football seasons this year, one in the spring and one in the fall. I also want to call out Coach Stephen Davis and his colleagues for a job well done. The Northwest High Marching Band recently had the opportunity to represent North Carolina at the Pearl Harbor 80th Commemoration Concert Series held last Tuesday at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Though strong storms move the event indoors, the band students still got to have a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Thank you to band director Brian McMath for preparing the students and representing Guilford County Schools with honor. The GCS Choice Showcase will return to the Greensboro Coliseum Special Event Center on Wednesday, February 2nd from 5.30 to 8 p.m., there you will find representatives from our more than 60 magnet and choice programs. Parents will be able to meet principals, ask questions, and get help with the online application. The magnet application window is January 14th through February 21st. Also, just to update the board, 
North Carolina A&T proposes a lab school that would be designed as a collaboration between GCS and North Carolina A&T to support an enhanced education program for students in grades three through five in our community with the greatest academic needs. Through small class sizes and an intensive focus on literacy development and STEAM education, students would have multiple opportunities to increase their academic skills before returning to a GCS middle school. The joint effort between North Carolina A&T and GCS would build on our longstanding partnership to invest in and provide the best educational opportunities and experiences for students in the community. Benefits of the partnership could include increased support and experiential educational learning opportunities for students not meeting expected academic growth standards, sharing of best practices and innovation in the science of reading and STEAM education, and multiple opportunities to engage with North Carolina A&T educator preparation student interns from one-on-one -on -one and small group tutoring. <coughs> North Carolina A&T proposes a school for 84 students on their campus at North Carolina A&T with after school programming as well as summer programming in the form of a freedom school uh, to prevent proposed learning loss and increase opportunities for success. In case you're unfamiliar with the language from the legislation, uh, you can find it in the general statute. A lab school requires approval of the Board of Education, and I will keep the board updated as I engage with, in discussion with Chancellor Martin and his staff. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to wish our GCS families a joyful holiday season. As I reflect on the year 2021, I find so many reasons to be joyful. I celebrate things I once took for granted, like the opportunity to see our students in the classrooms each day to share a meal with a friend at a local restaurant, to enjoy concerts and events again. These are gifts that we should continue to cherish long after the pandemic has ended. I hope the holidays bring you joy and peace and that the new year is filled with the hope of brighter days. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Contreras, I apologize. Um, we do have a committee report, um, policy committee. I'll turn to board member Betty Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. At the policy committee November meeting, the committee voted to send two revised policies out for a 30-day public comment. Those policies are policy number 35, I'm sorry, 3225-4312-7320 which is the technology responsibility use. And the last one is policy 9030, construction change orders. As a reminder, these policies will come back to the board for discussion at our February 8th meeting after public comment has a chance to weigh in. Great, thank you. I would like to give some acknowledgement that- Is your mic on? Uh, no. mm -hmm. I would like to tell the public that the, the 9030 change order is one that they may want to pay attention to because it authorizes um, change orders up to 500 without board approval. So it's something you want to pay attention to at one time. That was 100 not long ago. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so we can um, do board member comments before we go into closed session. You want to do that? All right, I'm getting some, some nodding here. Deborah, we'll start with you. Okay. You caught me at a good time. I was just at the end of my notes. Um, to acknowledge something that uh, board member Diane Bellamy Small mentioned, um, we sacrificed some nurse positions for these bonuses. <laughs> and normally I would be the first one to stand up and say, please protect this at all costs. And it breaks my heart to say it, but the nurses aren't there to be had. Um, it is one of the deepest fears I have sitting on this board is that teaching is going the way of nursing where there just simply are not enough of them. I, I and you know, is a conversation I've had with several colleagues and I'm looking at this going, what could we do to pull nurses to 
school nursing positions and the amount of money they can command right now is just the, the, the nurses aren't there to be had. And it genuinely makes me want to cry um, to watch my profession. To our teachers, um, it, it's as hard watching with you guys, too. We appreciate everything you're doing. And we hope that this is a good faith measure to make you want to stay with the district and continue to work with us and, and trust that we are going to do the best that we can to stand for you and make you feel valued and make you feel like GCS is your home because we would like to keep you for years and years and years to come. They talk about continuity in nursing. I like seeing continuity in my schools. The, the teachers at teaching around my kindergartner right now know entirely too much about the nappers because the oldest one is in fifth grade and they've already seen God only knows what. We'll just cut that right there. Um, so we will continue to work on this. Um, and hopefully, you know, as the little things come up like they have in the past, uh, when Angie mentioned at the last meeting, the little bonuses that we've been able to pull here and there will continue to come at us. Um, Dr. Contreras, Angie, their staff has made every effort to pass that along and will continue to do so. I would like to echo uh, Dr. Contreras's uh, honorable mention of Mrs. Carper. She is one of the English teachers at Northern High School. She was honored as the Regional Teacher of the Year. I was fortunate enough to be there and see her uh, receive that award. It was uh, just wonderful to see there again, you know, teachers honored at the peak of their profession. It was beautiful. Um, and last, I would like to mention happy holidays to everybody, however you celebrate, whatever you like to celebrate. I hope you are surrounded by those people who are important to you, whoever you love, be it family, be it friends. And I wish you many, many happy days. And y'all are going to laugh at me. But Mary Beth Murphy, this one's for you. Let's see if I can do it without smiling because it's not going to be easy. Thank you. Anita? I feel like I'm in the twilight zone here. <laughs> I'm not sure, but anyway. Uh, congratulations to the Dudley football team. I was really proud of them for winning the state championship and to Ms. Harper um, for her um, dedication and service to Guilford County Schools. And I'll keep this really brief and just wish everyone the best holiday season. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, um, whatever and however you celebrate. Hold your families close. Um, there are some good friends of this system who are not doing so well right now. And um, we need to remember them as it's going to be a hard holiday season for them. Thank you. Diane? Thank you. Um, I know our hearts and minds go out to the folks in Kentucky and the other states because as I watched um, that devastation, um, it brought me back to what we went through, even though what we went through pales compared to a whole city being, a whole town being wiped out, but we do know what that feels like. And, and whenever you hear them, you know, the folks trying to say rebuild. And even after three years, we still have places that haven't been touched. So it's going to be a long, long process. And I can't imagine how these folks are going to get through their holiday uh, season. So, um, you know, for those of us who understand that, you know, we, we will pray. Um, somebody made a comment, and I hope that it wasn't just made offhandedly. We've had, I think, five students who have been shot, whatever the reason was, shot and killed uh, this year. And I, and I want to appeal to, to our high school students, in particular middle school uh, high school students, please be in the right place uh, over these uh, holiday. Please, please be at home if home is a good place or at a friend's house, whatever. You know, you, you got to take some responsibility on where you are. Uh, granted, bad things do happen to good people, but uh, we got to, this is not a school problem, it's a community problem. Uh, the school can only do so much, and we can only protect our kids so much. Uh, so 
You know, all I'm saying is, is teenagers, you know, think about your choices before you make them um, and, and, and realize that if something happens to you, it happens to your family. It, it's not just you. That, that's going to be impacted by that. Um, I hope people take advantage of the opportunity for your children to get vaccinated because um, COVID is nothing to play with. Uh, on a personal note, I want to thank uh, GCS. <coughs> my my uh, granddaughter is going to graduate from ECU on Friday. Uh, she was in the STEM program at a &T. So she has actually finished her undergraduate studies in two and a half years. And so, I, 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 uh, Dr. Oakley, we can't emphasize enough the value of our uh, middle college programs. And, and I know her parents are elated. And to see this young lady, you know, instead of graduating at 22, she's graduating from college at 19. And so uh, we can't be prouder than that. But our, our system has a whole lot to offer our kids, and they can be uh, successful. So congratulations to uh, she was a, a 2019 graduate of the uh, a and STEM program, uh, Dion uh, Williams. And then um, the, the Greenway is um, a little more than three-fourths of the way uh, complete. If you hadn't, have not had a chance to look at the downtown Greenway, uh, it comes right across us down here at the corner of uh, uh, Fisher uh, and uh, Eugene Street. Um, it's supposed to be 70 degrees on Saturday. So there are days that you can walk if you choose to. Or uh, We've done a lot of work. We have a lot of public art on the Greenway. So I invite you and suggest that um, hopefully we will have the whole thing completed by um, the spring of this coming year. And then finally, I wish everybody a, a safe and, and happy holiday. And uh, Kwanzaa is the other celebration. It starts on the 26th and goes through January 1st. So. There are enough things for us to celebrate and reflect on as we uh, try to get into uh, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, staff, for all the hard work that you've done, for all the beat up that you've taken. Um, but you, you come to work every day. And whether we promise you a bonus or not, you still show up and you do a good job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. I think I would know the buttons by now. <laughs> Um, <laughs> thanks to, to everyone here. I uh, hope you that you uh, get some downtime over the holidays and celebrate and be close to your loved ones. And for those that um, may have a, a missing seat at the table uh, this holiday season, you know, I, I'm, I'm holding you in the light. Um, I know there's some up here and many of you that, that will experience that. And it's, it's no fun. And um, just want you to know that you're thought of and prayed for in that regard. Um, I'll do some congratulations and then I'll end with a bit of a challenge, I guess, to, to those here with me. Um, congratulations, Dudley High School Panthers. Um, yet another uh, Guilford County team uh, brings home a state crown. Uh, that's two in one year or less than one year. Um, so congratulations to Coach Davis and, and all the staff. Um, sports are very important. Uh, I think they've even taken on more importance during this time of COVID. So just want to lift those uh, players, families, and teachers up. Uh, the Northwest High School Band, I know we mentioned, thank you, Dr. Trez, for sharing that. You know, in every community, I'm always amazed that there's a vibe or a unique something that, that's a part of the school. Um, and at Northwest, it, it's banned um, from middle school on up. And whether it be art or, or music, um, you know, handbells, I mean, whatever it is, just keep, be mindful of that and, and let's support and encourage and, and empower those specials, as we call them, because they are very important. And, and I didn't realize that um, years ago until I got more familiar with the Northwest community, how important it is um, and that uh, that band and those specials can be so life changing uh, for students um, when they find, you know, their passion and it and it aligns with with their desires and so um that was no small feat i think northwest was one of 12 high school bands that was selected across the country to be able to go to uh, pearl harbor uh, on such a historic date so just wanted to um, lift that up and magnify that um and, and i'll end with a bit of a challenge for every seven hvac techs leaving the industry there are only three 
that enter the industry. Um, HVA businesses are very largely underrepresented by people of color. Um, and furthermore, the industry is up in, in, here in, in our school system, it's underrepresented by people of color. I want to change that. Um, and I hope that we'll make that a commitment with our CTE through public-private partnerships and uh, state legislators, and we can make that happen. I think particularly as we look at bond money and all these opportunities that we have, um, those should be extended to, to people um, that have been largely underrepresented for many, many years. And the only way to do that, I think it starts here in our school system. We can uh, create the curriculum. We can train those uh, folks and, and create a solution. And I think we can be a big part of that. So that's um, a little bit of a challenge and there'll be more to come on that. I'm, I'm doing some work kind of behind the scenes and, and I'll be able to share some things with you all. Um, also another congratulations. Uh, I was thrilled to see, and many of you had a lot of hand in this, um, that we got our $3 million, the pilot for Guilford County for CTE um, to help really, um, really uh, expand our efforts in the wall to wall academies. Because as you all know, <clears throat> you can say it on paper, you can have it, uh, the instructors, you can have the building, but if you don't have the the equipment and some of those really fixed assets that you need, um, it just can't, it can't be as important and as significant as I know that it can. So uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Linda? Um, well, I, I want to bring up another issue. I want to take up an issue that wasn't overly brought up um, about getting our volunteers and our parents back in the building. Um, it is critical. The schools need the need volunteers in there. Um, these teachers are struggling um, because of the shortage of staff, lack of substitutes, and these people can be a critical asset. Um, and we need to make sure. You know, I've been made aware that um, there will be volunteers in our buildings to register students to vote. Okay, which I'm fine with, but you can't have these volunteers in and not allow parents in and other volunteers in. Uh, we can't be selective as to which volunteers we allow in. And so that has been brought to my knowledge. That's great. We do it every year, right? But, you know, you can't have one select group come in and not allow other groups to be in the building and especially parents. Parents are dying to get back into the schools and help do whatever they can. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, teachers, you know, I hear how hard you struggle. I mean, no volunteers, um, extra demands being placed on you, extra coverages being placed on you. you I'm gonna say, you know, you're appreciated. And, you know, I'm hoping somewhere down the road, things are going to get easier for us. Somewhere down the road, somehow, we're going to get the staffing we need to take off the um, extra effort you're having to put be placed on you. So I would personally have liked to provide a little more um, bonus for you. But, you know, at least it's a start. So the other thing I will say, too, is... Um, Everybody say a prayer for all those people that are not going to have a wonderful Christmas. So when you're there with your family, make sure you say that prayer for them. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Winston. Um, I'll be brief. I thank the colleagues who... Um, voted for me tonight to serve as vice chair and I'll um, serve as vice chair for the full board. I've enjoyed uh, supporting Dina, learning from her and, and really look forward to your leadership um, over the next year and supporting you. Um, I just think there are children and teenagers and teachers and staff and parents who are just all working really hard and um, we see specific examples of that all the time. So I wanna say thank you to all of you um, no one's working harder than the students, um, but we know 
that the adults are also working harder than perhaps they ever have before, uh, taking responsibility for student outcomes and working to make those better. Um, and I'll just shout out to one, uh, Annette Garvey, who has been the front office support person at Kaiser for many years and worked for the district for, I think, decades. I won't cite the number. Uh, retires this Friday. So Annette Garvey, and to all of those who are retiring after long, uh, distinguished careers, I've watched her. She's like an octopus with eight arms in the front office at Kaiser. My boys were there many years ago. Um, I've seen her answer the telephone and talk to parents, page teachers, soothe a sobbing child who's having an anxiety attack, and direct three volunteers to go solve other problems all at the same time. And she represents the very best of our employees. There are lots of Annette Garveys out there, or people like Annette, but there's only one Annette Garvey. So Annette, I hope you ride lots of horses, make beautiful cakes, grow plants, and <laughs> go party in fun places. Um, thank you for your service, and thanks to all the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Kim? I can remember when CTE was me learning how to type on a typewriter. Okay? We've come a long way, and we got a long way to go um, with technology. I'm grateful um, just for being here. I want to say congratulations to those that are retiring. I know we're losing uh, Anna. And then we found out Leonard, he's leaving. Um, retiring. You're retiring, of course. Yeah, they're retiring, and you know, you know, we just. I want to say thank you um, to those individuals um, for being who you are and for GCS and your um, dedication. So to them, I'm going to read a poem that was shared with me: uh, "Freedom to heal, love, and be heard, free from fear, violence, and generational trauma." Healing takes place once we have been heard and I have a voice that will not be silenced because we want carefree black babies who know only a safety and beautiful communities with deep love, connectedness, and interdependence, not repeated and normalized violence. We deserve to live in joy, peace, and happiness without worry. For generations of pain to heal like cotton candy when it touches our lips. For the soil of our communities to be fertilized by our children's smiles, fellowship, and laughter, not their blood. We deserve to experience deep, unconditional love, free from trauma created by the fears of wearing a hoodie, walking in a neighborhood alone, shopping, and wondering if this time is the last time we will hear from our loved ones. We deserve to have our own beliefs, ideas, aspirations, dreams, hopes, thoughts, and feelings honored and come to love. Simply for us, Healing is not an option, it's mandatory. So let's create spaces for healing, the healing of ourselves, communities, and families for our future generations, land, and ancestors. This was written by Essence I. Foster. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Betty? Good evening again. Um, first, uh, for the record, I wanna make sure it's noted that I did not I did not ask the board to change the policy about individuals wearing masks. It was a question due to many observations in the building and also um, people who are watching. Now, the GTCC Greensboro School Academy had a virtual eighth annual stepping up to sleep out. They had a sleep out for homeless or um, I call it transitional students, so that went very well. And again, I would like to echo my Dudley Panthers. For well, the seventh time, they have won the 3A state championship. So kudos go out to Coach Stephen Davis and also to the principal, Mr. Say Timmons McLaughlin. Um, I would say Panther pride. Happy holidays goes out to each and every one of you all. I thank the parents for sending us the best child they have. I also thank all the staff for all you do to educate our children. Enjoy your families and your friends and stay safe. Happy holidays. Thank you, and I'll try to be brief. I know it's, it's feeling like the old Greer days being here this, this late. <laughs> 
Um, but um, you know, I, I watched the local news or state news um, during breaks at work, and um, there was a story this morning, I think it came out of Sampson County, about a retired couple that had to adopt their two nieces. Um, and the, the story went on to say that one child loses a parent or caregiver for every four COVID deaths. So this isn't just a simple decision, mask or not, volunteers or not. Betty and I were on a, <coughs> a call um, with um, some community members, and uh, we were talking about the, the bond and the condition of our schools. And someone started to share just what they knew about the condition of our schools. And we're encouraging people to go to the school and tour the school. And we were like, no, don't, don't do that because... Um, you know, if, if anyone gets exposed, the quarantine will interrupt instruction and create just a domino effect. And so, um, so um, I appreciate Commissioner Alston working with the superintendent to um, allow community members and other county commissioners to um, tour some of our facilities on the weekends or after school hours to limit exposure. Um, because whether or not it's just a few kids that get COVID or it's not that dangerous or people recover, um, it, it's just not that simple. And I think when we take a complex problem and make it simple, then people just believe that we're making political decisions. And so, um, you know, I, I hear you, Linda, about the, um, you know, respiratory annoyance of these masks. Um, but I had COVID and I have not recovered um, from my oxygen saturation from uh, that. And so it is, it is not good, and the consequences could be damaging over the long haul. So um, I, I'm just not going to make those decisions for people um, because the exposure um, leaves consequences that could be life-altering. Um, I, I also want to correct some misinformation. It's okay to disagree, but it, misinformation is just harmful to our, our dialogue and our efforts to collaborate. Um, you know, the, the comment today about the, the Navy ship Comfort that was docked in New York that was supposed to help relieve some of the um, <coughs> pressure put on our hospitals, um, you know, and the statement that it was empty just because there were not people in the hospitals is absolutely untrue. Um, one, the president at the time, President Trump, um, said that no COVID patients could enter the ship. Then there were 49 medical conditions that were not allowed. And then there were military protocols and other bureaucracies that kept people from being able to fully utilize the space. And the hospitals were so full and under so much pressure, people did die in the hallways. My mother-in-law got sick back in the summer. I had to do a school board retreat from the emergency room. We were in the emergency room part, not in a triage or not even in a bed, for 20 hours, 20 hours. She never made it to a room. She was in the hallway with a curtain for two days before she could be transferred to a facility. So the, these things just aren't true to underplay, you know, to diminish and minimize the impact of, of this virus is, um, is harmful. I have family members. I have a, a um, family members that um, has is asthmatic, and he wears a mask all the time. He's so used to it. When he's he was in my house the other day, and I'm like, take your mask off, you know, because it's seven o'clock and we're watching t TV, and he's sitting there with his mask on. I have a five year old that's with me all the time. She's not mine, but she's my neighbor, and a lot of you have met her. She went with me to um, Archer Elementary School for the um, <clears throat> for the presentation on the Montessori program. And, um, you know, she wears her mask all day and had it on all evening. And it's just, unfortunately, just routine. And, um, you know, they do, they do as well as they can with it. And so, um, so not all parents and not all children um, are struggling and, um, you know, being burdened by this. They're resilient, they're adaptive, they're flexible, and they're figuring out how to make it work. Is it going to slip down? Um, are they not going to get them replaced? I mean, things happen in the best of circumstances. And uh, the last thing I want to say, of course, well, two things. One, as a mother of a Dudley alum, congratulations to, to the Dudley High School Panthers. And then I would like the, to thank um, Principal Sophia Roberts at Archer, Principal Dr. Ashley Triplett at Peck, and Mr. Dixon at
Faust. It was so much fun being with the superintendent and Jose and, and Dr. Um, Kay and the architects and talking about these amazing programs, gaming and robotics, the expeditionary learning and the uh, Montessori program. I've learned a lot and it was just wonderful being there. So thank you. And uh, with that said, uh, well, is there a motion, Anita, to go into closed session? I move we go into closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to discuss personnel matters protected by state law. Chair second. 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 All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we're in closed session, or we're going to closed session. And when we come back out, we will take action, and then we will adjourn. Uh, no.
Port, um, Board as the principal of the Guilford eLearning Virtual Academy beginning January 1st, I'd like to appoint Adato Kumbo Wall, Tox Wall, and as the principal of the New Southwest Middle School beginning July 1st, Michelle Thigpen. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, as we adjourn, I would like to um, recognize Leonard Simpson, who is retiring soon and <laughs> had the pleasure of knowing Leonard for a very long time. I used to watch him when he was the uh, anchor on the news. And so, uh, Leonard, if there's anything you'd like to say and, and leaving, you're the person who makes sure people see us and we, you know, um, uh, stay connected to the broader community. Well, thank you for the kind words. I just want to say it's, it's been an honor and a privilege to work here for almost 16 years. Wow. And that was after a career in television news. Um, everyone I've worked with has always been professional. And um, when you see what I've seen, the work that goes into helping the, the kids in this county, you really have a renewed respect for the people that sit on this board and the people out here that work and support the schools. So I've been very proud to be a part of it. And uh, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do in the future, but I'm going to give it hell. <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations. So and again, thank you. All the behind the scenes work, making sure equipment gets to different locations. And so you just don't see all of the things that go on um, behind the scenes. So you make us look good and enjoy your retirement for the two weeks that you're probably going to sleep late. And, and then we'll see you somewhere. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Happy holidays. And we're adjourned. Aye.